Um, so the first thing, so I'm going to call this meeting to order. Uh, first thing is to review and approve the agenda. And um, I think there's one switch that I would like to make, uh, which is just switching the order of items nine and 10, the water resource recovery facility, uh, phase two project discussion and the conservation fund award uh, to have the con con conservation fund award come before uh, the water resource recovery item, unless there's a reason why we need to have it in the order that it's in. Any thoughts on that? Nope, okay. Um, any other changes to the agenda? Okay, great. Um, so without objection, we'll consider the agenda approved. And uh, so we're on to general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to make a, a comment to the council uh, or to make any, any kind of statement. Um, if you would say your name, uh, where you live and try to keep your comments to two minutes or, or less, that'd be great. And that applies to any comment um, generally through the meeting. And then um, there's, uh, oh yeah, so the other thing is that uh, comments during this section should be uh, about anything that is otherwise not on our agenda. If it does pertain to an item, then um, you can comment uh, when we get to that item. Um, the only other thing I want to mention before I forget is that when we get to 8.30, we are going to have a, a break for 10 minutes. Um, and so that means that if, um, if we're in public comment, we'll wait till the, the last person has wrapped up their comments and we'll take a break. Or if we're in the middle of a presentation, we might, I might actually interrupt someone and, and say like, hey, hold that thought. We're going <laughs> to we're gonna take a 10 minute break. But that's uh, what we're going to do at 8.30. Um, and I think that is it. And I so to indicate that you want to make a comment, you can use the um, raise hand feature, which is under reactions, or um, you can turn your camera on and physically wave, or you can unmute yourself and just let us know that you want to make a comment. And uh, I see I see you there, Peter, uh, that you want to make a comment. So go ahead. Excuse me, I've got a little bit of allergies going here. Um, Peter Kalman, uh, I, I'm in District 3. I'd like to talk a bit about my ride by GMT. Uh, since early in March 2020, I've had the privilege and responsibility of serving on what is now called the My Ride Community Advisory Group. For those who may not know, My Ride with GMT is a new flexible schedule, flexible route public transportation service in Montpelier. Operated by Green Mountain Transit, my ride is a pilot project that features technology enabled that provide curb to curb service, taking you when and where you need to go. The idea of bringing such a service to Montpelier was one of the creative suggestions that emerged in 2016 from Sustainable Montpelier Coalition's 2030 design competition. It was proposed as one possible way to reduce the number of single passenger vehicles in downtown Montpelier, which would in turn both decrease greenhouse gas emissions and allow for the conversion of downtown parking lots and spaces to carbon dioxide absorbing public green spaces and much needed workforce and senior housing. Over the past four years, members of the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition and their allies carried out an extensive process of research, public engagement, and dialogue with vendors and government transportation entities, which ultimately led to the government-funded two-year pilot program, My Ride by GMT. In preparation for launch of that pilot in January 2021, the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition, Green Mountain Transit, and the Vermont Agency for Transportation convened an advisory group consisting of a broad range of stakeholders, including representatives from the Vermont Center for Independent Living, Capstone, Montpelier Senior Activity Center, Central Vermont Medical Center, and Montpelier Alive, as well as relevant government entities, including the Agency of Human Services, Central Vermont Planning Commission, and the Montpelier City Council. That group has been meeting regularly since March 2020. We had our first meeting just before things shut down for COVID. And during these meetings, we've been commenting on program features, sharing suggestions and criticism. Um, uh, and since the launch in, in January, we've been reviewing operational metrics being collected daily by GMT. Throughout this process, the staff from GMT 
has sought and received the candid advice of stakeholder representatives with the shared priority that this service must do no harm to existing riders who are primarily a mix of low income, homeless, carless, disabled, seniors, students. In regard, in this regard, the COVID restrictions on passenger density has turned out to be a blessing in disguise. It has meant that the January 4th, 2021 launch of the pilot was necessarily limited to reaching only several hundred riders. This unplanned, very soft launch enabled SMC members and volunteers to personally interview and educate current riders in the months leading up to the launch and it allowed GMT and its very experienced software vendor to test their system in the unique setting that Montpelier presents. This turned out to be very fortunate as it revealed numerous glitches and unanticipated startup problems that while a bit frustrating to users, didn't rise to the level of the disaster that might have occurred if the rollout had been robust. So thanks to this unplanned soft rollout, meticulous gathering and analysis of data, genuine stakeholder involvement of the MyRide Community Advisory Group, and a determination to do no harm to the more vulnerable members of our community. The chances, I think, are very good that this innovative approach to transportation in Montpelier will prove to be a success and will contribute to Montpelier's net zero energy goals. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, Steve Whitaker here. Go ahead, Stephen. Uh, I, I'll uh, keep track of my equal time here. Uh, I am troubled by the disregard of the city recurring to adhere to public records law, open meeting law. Uh, and the fact that I made a public records request, I, I Ed spoke to the council, I said, this consolidated fiber build is causing problems. And then I said, we need to look at having an ordinance. And then I sent information to some of the council members about, and the public works director about a one uh, dig once ordinance that's in other places and our statutory goals that require we not dig up the streets multiple times. And yet, I was told there were no records regarding consolidated efforts to bury conduits on the road, under the road. And I, and then I found out that wasn't true. And not only wasn't it true, the records weren't supplied to me until after the vote of approval had been taken. So I don't know whether that's ineptitude or corruption, but it's not okay either way. You know, uh, the fact that it, it has been raised to the council. It shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't force your citizens to have to have the courts rule on whether you're serious about adhering to the law or not. That's just fundamentally, that's your job and you're not doing it. You know, records to, uh, I have to not give legal advice because I'm, it's not legal for me to do that, but I have to inform Chief Pete. It's not okay to say, I don't think I can find any records. He has to say, I certify there are no records. And I've informed him of that, and he has not done so. Similarly, an appeal to the head of the agency was filed regarding these permit records. Bill Frazier has not responded to that appeal to the head of the agency. You have five days to do it, or it's right for court. Like, what the hell is going on with this council? You know? It, do you think you're above the law? And I, I just find it outrageous, you know? And, and I shouldn't. It should be, it should be like uh, falling off a log. You should be strictly adhering to public records law and no ifs, ands, or buts, and no sloppy excuses because we don't have a staff attorney, you know? But I would like for you all to have some discussion about this because there's no excuse for it. You should have, once you became aware, once Jack became aware of that, that records request had not been honored, you should have repealed those permits until this was sorted out, you know, and make sure that dual conduits go under those roads so CV fiber can pull the same ones without cutting the same roads. I mean, this is not rocket science. 
Secondly, my request about the housing authority that we have an old veteran who's sleeping in a burned out apartment because the housing authority cannot find him alternate lodging while they settle their insurance claims and get a contractor ready to resheet rocket. That's outrageous. And it's been raised in Dan Richardson. I've asked for repeated calls numerous times, you know, for return calls. Have, you know, Rick DeAngelis, but get this guy out of his burned out apartment. We're better than that. At least I hope we are. Some of us are. There, thanks. For the record, that's not a factual statement. Um, yeah, and you say a lot of non factual statements too, Bill. Which the person is actually the housing authority has actually not allowed the person into his apartment and he's insisted on returning. Uh, they have attempted to find alternate housing for him that he's declined. So the housing authority is not forcing anyone to live in a burned out apartment. Uh, we did look into they the offered him what they offered him an apartment where a woman had burned herself mm -hmm. to death that had not yeah. been cleaned. So Stephen, let's let him finish, no. okay? I, I don't have any more to add. Steve's making accusations that aren't true. Um, Okay, uh, well, thank you. Um, all right, anyone else? Okay, uh, all right then. Uh, so moving on then to the consent agenda. Um, is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? Jack. I move the consent agenda. Second. Okay, we got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Yes, Donna. <laughs> oh, you're muted, Donna. I was referring to the minutes on April 28th. Just a small addition uh, that I've already given John, but is not in the attached copy for the minutes of April 28th, City Council. It's item 133. It says, Councilor moved and Richardson second to approve the appointment to the CV Fiverr. And so I just wanted to insert my name. I made the motion. Very simple change. Okay. And uh, so no, any objections to that? Nope. Um, so there's there's a, a motion and a second. Uh, to to the those who made the motion and second, are you amenable to uh, including that that change to those yes. minutes? Okay, great. So um, that's that's included. Um, any further discussion? Okay. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. And opposed. Okay. All right. So the consent agenda passes, and so we're on to appointments to the development review board. Um, so there are a couple folks who are up for reappointment, and I saw. Uh, Kate McCarthy here, um, and I'm not sure if I see uh, Joe Kiernan, but uh, Kate, would you be up for introducing yourself and just telling us about, um, yeah, about the Development Review Board and interested in, in staying on? Certainly. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, members of the City Council. It's a pleasure to see you all this evening. Thanks for being here. Um, I've been the chair of the City of Montpelier Development Review Board for just over a year, starting in February 2020, that magic month before, um, and have worked with the DRB members over the last year to try and keep things rolling. And it's been an interesting challenge, but um, but gone. And I've been really, really glad to serve in that capacity. Um, I'd like to continue. Uh, I've served on the Development Review Board in different capacities since 2013, just a couple of years after moving to Montpelier. And it's just, um, it just seems like a very, uh, I won't say easy, but a very fitting way to contribute some of my personal and professional interests um, in service of the city. Um, it, it's a pleasure to do it. I, I, I want to say that I, um, well, two things. One, the staff support that we receive for the DRB makes it possible to do this as the volunteers. So shout out to Meredith Crandall, Audra Brown, and um, Tammy Furry, the reporting secretary. And I also would, would like the counselors to know that um, I think we've, we've always had a really good mix of people on our DRB. And I'm very proud now of the people who are serving because of the variety of backgrounds that they bring to it. 
Um, I think it's always in my interest and the interest of the, of the city in general to uh, keep diversifying those backgrounds, backgrounds of experience professionally and, and lived. Um, but I, I think we're, we're working well together as a board right now, and I'm pleased to support that. Great. And uh, thank you. And I, I don't, again, I don't think I see Joe, but I could be wrong. Joe, are you here? Okay. Um, so there are uh, two spaces, I suppose, and two folks who have reapplied um, for the Development Review Board. Um, there's also um, appointments to be made to uh, the Energy Advisory Committee. Uh, these are student appointments. Um, Greta Sabo and Ava Stumpf have been uh, or have um, expressed interest in serving on that committee as youth members, but I don't see either of them on, but I could be wrong. Uh, Greta or Ava, if you are here, um, if you could speak up, that'd be great. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, since, uh, since they are not here, um, is uh, there a motion regarding uh, these appointments or we can go and do executive session? Um, yeah. Uh, Connor. Well, I, I hate to trample on past practice. It does seem pretty cut and dry today, unless anybody objects. Um, I, I, I would be willing to make a motion uh, to reappoint uh, Kate McCarthy and Joe Kiernan to the DRB and the students Greta, Greta Sabo and Ava Schrumpf uh, to the uh, Energy Advisory Committee. And, and so there's a second, uh, but just to be clear for Greta Sabo and Ava Sumpf, you mean that you're appointing them as student representatives. That's exactly um, what I meant. Youth, youth that's, members. That's exactly yeah, what right. I meant. Yeah, right, okay. <laughs> just, just making that clear. And that's okay with you, Dan? Yeah, that's, okay. that's understandable. Okay, great. Uh, all right, so there's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Uh, Donna. Well, I mean, I want to thank them all for service and the new ones, the willingness to come on board, but especially Kate, you've been a long timer and that's a lot of time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I, I, yeah, I share ahead, that as well, C certain gratitude and certainly, um, you know, I, I, no offense that uh, it's probably gotten a better board since I moved off. So, um. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but thank, thank you. Thank you for willing your willingness to step up. And I think we're lucky to have um, you and Joe serve on the uh, DRB uh, because they make it a much smoother place uh, for these, these review of these applications and the wealth of knowledge, that particularly you bring Kate um, with your planning background. I think we're a, a great thing to have. Thanks, Dan. Okay, so there's been a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, and opposed. Okay, well, thank you again, Kate. And please pass along our congratulations also to, uh, to Joe and uh, Greta and Ava, if you are listening. Congratulations to you as well. Um, I'm psyched to have um, some youth members on the Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee. That's gonna be great. Um, all right, so thanks everybody. Um, all right, so we are up. Good night, thank you. Yeah, good night. Um, we are up to um, the Home Energy Information Ordinance uh, for the third reading. Um, so I'm gonna officially open the public uh, hearing on that. Um, so we just have a, a few uh, talking points and a, a few slides to share. Um, so I'm gonna kick us off here just with a few uh, points uh, about um, changes that we've made. Uh, we're really grateful for all of the feedback that we've received and uh, we were able to uh, incorporate um, not necessarily all of it, but a lot of it um, into some of the changes. So in the uh, attachments, there are um, the responses that we received from our lawyer about questions that we had posed to him, uh, as well as uh, a red line version of the ordinance um, since, um, since the last time. So I just wanna point out, first of all, some of the uh, points that our lawyer, or some of the answers that our lawyer gave us, 
as well as um, some of the changes that have been made in the red line version of uh, the, uh, the uh, draft ordinance language. Um, so the first thing, there was one question about uh, privacy, about uh, the privacy of uh, information. Um, so it sounds like there may be some legal space for uh, currently for this information to be public. Uh, but in a follow up conversation that I had with a lawyer, so this is not included in, in what was um, in the attachment, uh, but in a follow up conversation um, that I had with a lawyer, he made it clear to me that if we were to craft an agreement with either Clearly Energy or anyone upstream from them, the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnership or Efficiency Vermont, um, that that would be it would be possible to write an agreement uh, with them in such a way that would make it clear that the city does not have ownership or control of the data. Uh, so the committee is already committed to doing that and already on track to make such an agreement and the lawyer is on board with that plan. Um, there's also a question about uh, what do we do when the uh, when the seller has to make their best guess. Uh, so the lawyer addressed that question, um, issue of, of liability, if, if the seller's making their best guess. So the short version is that he felt that it's clear that the sellers are filling this out to the best of their, abil their ability, and that um, should be sufficient um, for coverage for them. Um, in terms of appeals, so in the, the newest version, uh, the appeals section was uh, consolidated with the penalty section and just as we were intending to rely upon state processes for appeals it was clarified uh, in this section that the appeals would go through the judicial bureau um, so it's also worth noting in this section that the lawyer recommended that we set the cap at a thousand dollars rather than 500. so that's what the current draft says if folks would like to reset to reset that to something lower i'm sure that that is something that we could discuss also in the draft ordinance language, um, uh, the uh, actual profile does not need to be filed with the city, just the certification um, that it's uh, been doubly signed with the, uh, with the buyer. Um, and another sort of notable uh, change that we made to the ordinance language, um, we heard people about uh, the need for some time to uh, to continue to uh, test this out. And so we've modified the date that the penalties kick in to be January 1st, 2022, uh, which would build in some time for this process to continue to be voluntary. So during that time, uh, we will be able to collect data, continue to receive feedback and make adjustments to the system as needed. We think that that would be uh, good. We, we think that it would be good to have a check-in uh, meeting or an update on how it's going sometime later in the year. So that's um, just a few uh, highlights of things that have changed in the ordinance language itself. And I am going to pass it on to, to Lauren um, to talk about some um, equity issues. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. So, you know, some of the questions that we've been hearing had to do with the potential equity impacts of this policy. So I brought this, uh, this issue to the city's Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee, and that group didn't take an official action, but we did um, use a tool that we had developed that some of you um, might have seen uh, during budget season of looking at um, potentially impacted groups of uh, residents and then potential negative impacts, positive impacts, and ways that you might be able to mitigate. Um, so just wanted to share a few of the highlights of, of Kind of considerations that that group was thinking through. Um, so high level, you know, there was kind of an, an overarching, you know, this policy being part of our kind of climate work as a city and acknowledging that climate change, um, there's lots of evidence that lower income people, people of color are hit hurt first and worst by climate change and young people will face the worst impacts of climate change. So there was a general, you know, taking climate action uh, when and where we can um, from an equity perspective, there's there's good arguments to be made there. Um, going a little more into the details of the policy, there was a big focus from that group on just transparency and disclosure as being um, generally beneficial to, um, to people in the community, um, you know, identifying that for every requirement that this puts on a seller, 
um, that needs to provide this information. There's a buyer who can benefit by making a better informed decision. Um, we thought through how different community members might be impacted differently, um, thinking through, for example, um, young people and BIPOC Vermonters um, are more likely to be home buyers than sellers. There's currently a large discrepancy in home ownership um, among BIPOC and white Vermonters, and young people, of course, are more likely to be first-time home buyers. So again, having this information as a home buyer can help, um, help inform your purchase. Um, we thought about people with low or fixed incomes, um, and I'm just giving a few highlights. There's more detail if anyone um, has questions. But um, for sellers, of course, uh, they would need to provide this information. There's the $15 filing fee. Um, and then for every seller, there's also a buyer. So there's for lower income or fixed income buyers of a property, again, having this information about energy costs and being able to um, make better informed decisions and plans seems like a benefit for that population. Um, we talked about access to affordable housing. That's one of the issues that's come up. And, you know, and looking at what information we had available, um, you know, of course, affordable housing is a major equity concern in our community. Um, we concluded that this particular ordinance is not going to be a major driving driver in access to housing, to affordable housing, or have a major impact on housing prices. Um, and finally, we identified um, that there are populations that could have lack of computer or internet access or computer skills and, you know, or for whatever reason might have trouble filling in the form. So we wanted to be really sure and really clear in um, tonight's hearing that, you know, if we move ahead with this, that the city really needs to be committed to providing support for access to the computer, internet, and help filling it out for people who need that help um, so that we can make this feasible for everyone to um, be following the ordinance. Um, so that was our kind of commitment we would hope to see tonight. So those are some of the highlights. Um, thanks. Um, great, and I think um, next up is uh, Veronique. Yeah, um, hi, I'm Veronique with um, Clearly Energy. So um, I have a slide, which I don't know if it was provided or not, but I have to talk through it. It's just one slide. Um, my goal is really to try to help demystify the, the modeling approach. Um, hang on one, one second, sorry, uh, Kate, go ahead. Well, Kate's going to share the slide. Oh, there we so. go. Okay. So go ahead, Baron. Yeah, I think um, you know from from earlier meetings, um, you know people have, have voiced concern that and, and a sense that this model was sort of dropped on the citizens of Montpelier out of nowhere. And so I wanted to provide a little bit of background, both on the methodology and the testing that the model has gone through. So. Um, the first component of the, of, of the model are federal appliance standards. Um, that obviously covers, you know, the appliances like refrigerators, washers. There are also standards for an efficiency standards um, for water heaters, um, space heaters, air conditioning um, with differentiations between normal standards and energy star standards. And so where you see kind of, um, you know, breakdowns by, by groups of years is to actually match back to historic um, appliance standards. So that's kind of the first component going into that. The model shares some pretty key assumptions um, with the federal models that are used. For example, if you go through um, an in-home audit, an in-home audit, something like a home energy score. So all the assumptions, for example, on um, occupancy link consumption, which includes water consumption. Um, how many loads of wash, um, that is completely shared with, um, for example, the home energy score model. The um, space heating and air conditioning components um, um, are calculated on an annual basis and depend on the size of the home. The type of the home, meaning that a detached home, so it's a standalone single family home, has a, a different energy footprint from a condo, an attached home, uh, mobile homes are treated separately, as are multifamily units. Um, weather obviously comes in, so for Montpelier, the same, same input weather applies across Montpelier. Um, the other factors that go into determining the space heating are the amount of weatherization, the qualitative description of air leakage, and then back to the appliance standards, uh, the overall efficiency of the system. 
And that piece has been tested against a federal data set called the Residential Energy Consumption Survey data, which is um, something that the Energy Information Agency collects approximately every five or six years. Um, and then finally, for um, uh, the last two pieces, lighting and plug load, plug load being kind of the catch-all for everything else. That's your, you know, your toaster, your uh, your computers, your printers, every, all of that, you know, your, your phone plugged into the wall. Um, those are drawn from um, federal studies and the reference are at the bottom of the, um, of the page. So in terms of performance in Vermont, um, the Vermont Energy Investment Corp, um, which is, and I don't know exactly their relationship, but essentially Efficiency Vermont, sister company or whatever, you know, um, they um, took the model and ran it um, against homes that had gone through an in-home home energy score. Now, the in-home home energy score is still a model estimate. Um, so this is a model to model comparison. Um, on average, the models are very close. So there are going to be differences from one home to the next, obviously, um, but they average out to um, things that are quite similar. And the correlation of the two models is also quite high. So above 80% really was 90% for the electricity component of the model and above 80% for the individual fuels, noting that um, we definitely had a greater sample size for natural gas homes than for homes that may have had multiple fuels or, you know, lesser use fuels like, like wood and things like that. Um, the model has also been tested independently by the Rocky Mountain Institute, which is a well-known well -known nonprofit. Um, in the United States, on 8,000 homes, there were two models tested. Um, this was really kind of a, a, a test of a, you know, kind of very mini version of the model of very few parameters to see how, whether it could capture um, the gist of energy consumption across the, across the US. Um, ours was definitely the better performing of the two models and the full reference to the study is also at the bottom of the slide. And then finally, the model has recently been adopted for use by one of the two federal mortgage backers, um, the government sponsored entities, which are better known as Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Um, to estimate um, the home energy burden across their portfolio. So the model will be used um, across the board at, at the federal level. So hopefully this, you know, you are at the forefront, um, but, um, but, um, but this, is, this is also happening, happening at the federal level. Um, and then finally, two things. Um, I think, you know, as a developer, I really appreciate kind of all of the input and feedback through this process. I think we have, uh, you know, a really strong commitment to help anybody that will need help in generating their, their vHealth profile. There is now a help button, I think, on every page um, along the process. Um, and I think we've been pretty responsive at, at addressing issues. And so from experience with the beta tester group in Montpelier, um, even if it does take people a few minutes to get started and get registered, um, you know, after, it really does not take more than, than five or 10, people, 10 minutes for people to kind of get, get comfortable with the system. And, and certainly, and especially at the beginning, we are very happy to kind of walk as many people through this as, as needed. And then if anybody else, you know, has, has thoughts or things that they want to, to discuss, I think we we're continue to be, you know, available um, and, and encourage feedback. So that was, that was big modeling background. Great. Thanks, Veronique. And Kate. Okay, so um, I just volunteered to share a little bit about some of the updates that have been made um, to the tool since the first hearing and um, volunteered my house just as an example. So, you, so those of you who haven't seen it, um, this is the website, clearlyenergy.com slash Vermont, if you want to test it out on your own. Um, so one of the things that we, you know, this shows kind of, I just took a screenshot of what my profile looked like um, when I just initially registered my house. Um, this was without any of the input of the actual bill data. Um, 
And then as what we talked about last time was that you do have the ability to enter in your own energy bill. And for folks who are wondering where that is, um, there's just this section with the pencil icon to enter your own fuel cost. Um, we did add a feature that allows you to choose between putting it in as dollars or in actual you know, gallons of oil, kilowatt hours. So that is now an option to, to toggle. So you can see here at the bottom, there are, you can put it in, in dollars or you can switch to the type and switch it to fuel and electricity amount and then it'll, you have options for kilowatt hours and gallons and I have wood, so I have cords of wood per year. And so you can see how this changes the model um, and the profile once you've input that information. Um, in my case, it reduced my actual expected energy cost by around $400. And you can see this section shows up on the profile itself. Um, so these are the actual kilowatt hours that I input, and, it, and there is a sentence that gets added in that says, these are calculated from homeowner provided bill data. Um, so just wanted to kind of show what that looks like um, for folks who haven't had a chance to actually use the tool or generate a sample profile. And that's it. Okay, great. And uh, Donna. All right. Um, can everybody hear me? Yep. Okay, great. I've been having some problems with um, connecting. So I, um, I am going to explain how we're going to provide information for anybody who's interested in this um, effort, um, where it's going to exist and what we'll be doing long term. So um, this is a program that I think everybody will agree is changing um, the way we behave around um, households and energy um, in the city. And so um, it's a change of um, program and activity for everybody who will be involved. And there are four steps to making positive change. They start with contemplation and preparation, and that's all that we've been talking about um, so far in these meetings, and that has been presented well to um, all of you. The second, uh, the third and fourth components are the action that's going to be taken, which will happen tonight, um, and then the maintenance of the program and the understanding and um, explanation to the um, individuals who will be at different points in time looking to um, get involved in this process. Um, and so the um, city is going to maintain a um, web presence. We'll do that through the Public Works Department. I'll be championing that along with our administrative assistant, Jasmine Benson. We will provide um, a basic document that um, is designed to, in plain English, explain the process to individuals, um, answer questions. We will um, provide comments back when people have an interaction with us so that um, future um, interested parties can benefit by that. Um, Change can be challenging, um, but I think that we have in Public Works championed a number of initiatives lately that have required similar um, efforts to be taken, and we've done that with success. Um, so we'll also keep um, a log of questions um, and um, answers that have been um, provided. Um, and we will, um, I'm sorry, um, I just lost <laughs> the screen. I'm back again. Thank you, sorry about that. Um, so um, we'll take everything from start to finish, explain the tool, help engage residents, um, talk with current homeowners, um, answer questions for, um, prospective buyers, prospective sellers, 
around the or um, this ordinance um, and um, and essentially be um, the eyes and ears to help the city make this a successful endeavor. Um, happy to answer any questions about that. Um, and that's pretty much um, the context that we have for going forward. We're generally going to make sure that we explain to anybody who's interested and help them understand how they can manage this process. Um, I want to also add to that that um, my understanding is that NEEP, the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnership, is planning on running trainings for uh, realtors to, to help get folks up to speed there. And uh, Efficiency Vermont is also um, using this same um, common energy profile in a different context. So they're going to be um, using or they're opening up or the, the plan is uh, that they'll, they'll be opening up a um, a hotline for folks uh, that have questions about this as well. So multiple avenues for support for folks if there are questions, which is great. Um, okay, so I think that is everything that uh, the committee wanted to um, put forward uh, from uh, our, our conversations. Um, so at this point, uh, so just so you know how, how this part will work, um, I'm going to uh, open it up for just clarifying questions from council, um, not not necessarily opining, but just anything like to clarify, and then um, uh, and then we'll open it up to the public, um, and then we'll go back to uh, to discussion uh, with the council. So, um, so first thing, um, uh, comments or questions, but not comments, um, clarifying questions from council. Uh, yes, Dan, go ahead. A question on the uh, the the V heap uh, form um, that Kate had had shown up. I'd seen it on mine, um, which is the main page on the left side. You know, it has that energy readout, and it says homeowner verified, and that appears whether you've entered the data or not. Is that correct? That is correct, and that's to distinguish it from um, the homes and the cases where we're able to pull in um, a third party verified score. So there are homes which have either a HERS rating or a home energy score um, in Vermont, it's more likely to be a HERS rating. That third party um, in home, well, in home with some caveats, but that 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 third party audit um, comes with a cost, which is what we what, which is what we use for those homes, and those show up as um, third party certified. Then there is an intermediate category, which is third party verified, if a um, accredited professional is the person that's actually um, updating the information on behalf of the on behalf of the homeowner. So there really are only three categories. Right. So the homeowner verified would be there even if someone was to put in, not put in any data on their own, but simply just generate the form, assuming and distinguished from uh, a third party who entered data on their behalf or a third party that had certified um, various pieces of the, the report, right? That, that, yeah, that, that is correct. I mean, we could have a default category that's just blank before anything is edited. Um, I mean, at some point, the homeowner, when they create the actual profile PDF, checks the box saying that even if they have not touched anything, that it looks okay to them. Um, but, um, and that then carries on over to, to, the, to the actual PDF profile. I obviously have some comments, but I'll, uh, that's the only clarifying question I have at this point. Thanks. Any other clarifying questions? Uh, Donna, go ahead. In that same area, if you leave it unchecked, it stays public. If you check it, it's private. Private to whom? Private to sharing. Well, okay. So you're talking about the, um, the, the box that is the, the, the checkbox just before creating the actual PDF profile. Is that that's correct? 
Well, it's the box right under after required. If I check it, I'm saying it's yes. correct. And yeah. So, that. so that box really is is primarily there for the for the Vermont voluntary program. So for them, um, it allows them to keep the profile undisclosed to any further interaction with with the real estate world. Um, so it we would not then you know share it under any circumstance with say Niren, which is the multiple listing system um, across most of Vermont. Um, for for Montpelier, where the disclosure is required, um, the box has no uh, the, the box is in in some ways more confusing than anything, and I completely agree with that. Um, but that's where it comes from. It, it comes from the voluntary statewide program. So at some point, whether I check that off or not, does my data go into an anonymous field to get a picture of house efficiency in Vermont? So the the, the opt-in opt-out is recorded in a database called Helix, um, which is maintained by um, the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnerships. Um, and that is, um, the system that can talk with the local um, and, and in the case of Niren, it really does not like interactively talk with Niren, but that's that's the database that aims to share home information with um, the local mul um, multiple listing system. So as far as far as Montpelier goes, once you end up with the PDF, you know that's that's what that's the piece of paper that you're supposed to share with. Um, you know, your real estate agent and, and buyers. Did we answer your question, Donna? Well, no, but maybe it's not appropriate here. I guess I thought it's there's a there's sharing with the real estate world, mm -hmm. but I thought there was a way that this data ultimately becomes anonymous to give the city a profile of where our houses are, where's our housing stock. So I I must have just right. That's a city question. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, no, I, I mean I, I don't mean to not answer it, but I think that's that's what Anne is trying to answer. Um, to, to what degree? Um, and again, I'm I'm gonna I'm not the best person to explain this, but um, we we want to make sure that these records can be kept um, private, um, and so if the city does have access. Um, that that it you know that they have the access that, that they might need for summary um, information that you know but 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 do not allow access to you know to the to the private private records so so that's um, that that's what the mayor is is trying to work out with the agreement she talked about. Great. Any other qu like clar clarifying questions? Uh, Jack, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if this is a clarification question or more of a implementation question, but I thought I'd start here. The mayor and I had a conversation about this today. Um, I know that a number of people, many people are uh, very concerned about the privacy of uh, any data about themselves that goes out there. And so you know, it's been a while since I've set up my own profile uh, here in the system, but uh, one of the things that occurred to me. I, was... I can't right now. Okay, Jack, keep okay. going. Okay, okay. One, one of the things that occurred to me is that it seemed that anybody, you know, there's a process where you're creating a profile and you claim a certain address uh, to be your own address. And I, I didn't see any uh, anything built into the system that would prevent anybody from claiming an address and becoming the owner of that address within the system, even if it's not their address. And uh, I don't know if that would be uh, something that would would have negative effects to people, but I, I, since people are concerned about getting, about personal data getting out into the public, I think it's something that we should clarify. 
and then the other question which is similar which is that uh, if a buyer if a seller creates a profile part of that is again claiming the address becoming the owner of that address within the within the system presumably the uh, the seller would at some point sell the property they're no longer the owner of the property but they're still the owner of that uh, address within uh, within your system and so I was wondering, well, what can we do, or, or is it is it possible to uh, transfer the ownership, or or prevent the former owner from making any changes to the to the record once that uh, once that person is no longer the owner, and then a third question is: is there within the system a way to keep the uh, seller's uh, information confidential once that person is no longer the owner of the property. So that seems like it's a bunch of questions, but they're all in the same uh, in the same area of, uh, of control of the data. Um, well, I can address the, the first two. So when you're initially claiming the home, there are two check boxes. One is I'm claiming the home, I'm the rightful owner. The second is um, allows you to lock the account and prevent anybody else from editing it for a period of 30 days. Um, and, and that lock once it expires, if you are the account holder, you can always go in the system and relock it. Um, so, so, there, that, so, so that's kind of how we ensure that if you don't want anybody else to access the profile, nobody else can access the profile. Um, um, the second question is there is a way to share the profile um, with either, you know, on a voluntary basis with, um, you know, a, another party or with the um, the buyer. Now, I'm not sure how the seller, you know, would know the identity of the buyer, um, but um, but but there is a way to sort of share access. So there is a way to lock and unlock access to the profile by by the the owner slash seller, um, and there is a way to share. And you know, all it does is it sends an email saying you've been invited to access this profile at this location. Um, so that I think addresses at least in part your second question. So the third question is more difficult because we have no information on the real estate transactions, um, which means we do not know when the ownership changes hands, um, at least not at this point. So besides the fact that the lock naturally expires, um, and that the new owner could then go in and claim the home and take it over that way. We don't have kind of a, you know, a rigorous way of, of automatically switching the ownership. This, that leads me to another question, which um, might, might get, a, get us somewhere. Um, once, once this profile exists, and and you've bought the house. You're the uh, you're the new owner of it. Um, is there any any use that you would be likely to make of this uh, profile as a homeowner, or is it only relate only really relevant to uh, a home seller? Like, would you? Would you care about even having it once you buy the house, or do you even care about having the profile? We well, we hope so. That's a broader <laughs> discussion. Um, I mean, I will give you sort of at least one example where it could become important. So we're currently running a pilot program with the Vermont State Employee Credit Union. They're offering a half a percent discount on the 30-year mortgage for anybody that wants to do um, an energy improvement on their home. So in this case, what we're seeing go through now with this are refinances. So those are owners that are refinancing their homes. They need to document the energy use consumption of their home. Um, 
there's a lot of it's a pilot there's a lot of figuring out that that is happening along the way but one of the documents that we're generating is the vermont home energy profile um for sort of the before and after the work of the home um you know there's a lot of other things happening with the pilot we're doing home energy scores um but that at least can give you some context as to how it can be useful down down the road you know i think the hope is that contractors adopt it and then when contractors are doing energy efficiency improvements on the home, you know, they can help. They can help show that, hey, look, you know, you've gone from here to here on the wedge, and and you've added, you know, a couple credits on the profile, and um, and hopefully, you know, people people see that their costs are going down and that their efficiency is going up. That's that's useful. Thank you. I have one. I think this is the last question for right now. Um, and again, it relates to uh, protection of data. Uh, I know it's not set up this way, but is it uh, is it within your capable technical capabilities to uh, to change the profile creating uh, process so that the profile is locked by default? And it would only become unlocked if the uh, owner of the profile uh, chooses to do that. Um, so, from a technical standpoint, yes, of course. Um, I think the question is, we do have to allow somehow for new owners to claim. Um, so, I think you know, if that's the route that you want to take then we would need to have sort of a, you know, oh, this problem, and, and this is what shows up now. It says, right, this home is locked for editing. You're out of luck. Um, um, an added thing that would say request permission, request, you know, re re request access, and that access would then be granted, but then we would need some rules um, to make sure that we're granting access to the person we're supposed to be granting to, namely the new owner. So. So there's a little bit of rule definition. It's not really a technical problem. It's more of a defining the rules um, that you want to operate by. Okay, thanks. Uh, Dan, go ahead. Sorry, Jack's line of questioning raised an, another issue that um, I, uh, occurred to me. When you, we talk about locking the profile, and certainly when we talk about transferring, you, you've outlined some of those issues, but I'm wondering um, you know, what if there is sort of a false owner that comes and squats on the profile and and locks it? Or I'm thinking in particular, uh, oftentimes property becomes contentious in divorce cases. So, you know, both people are on the deed, but one person is actually trying to sell it while the other person may be trying to frustrate such, such purposes. Um, you know, to what extent... I, and I think the questions within that are to what extent are you able to, and I presume the answer is you can do this technically, but is there any process in place for unlocking the profile if there's a, a, a false owner or a bad faith squatter of some kind? And the, the other is um, even if it is locked, um, can, the, can a person generate the necessary documents from the system? Um, uh, very good question. So we have a technical way of unlocking profiles. You know, we will generally, and that happened this past week, somebody was testing um, and, 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 and had some inquiries and we said, you know, do we have your permission to unlock it? We, we can unlock it. Um, I think if it's a contentious situation, it puts us in an interesting situation. Uh, I don't know, I guess, you know, as part of the rules of the road, we'd have to kind of know who to refer to as the city or, or you know, it, um, but from a technical standpoint, we can unlock um, a profile. Um, I can also jump in here too, Veronique, if you, I, I have some thoughts on this. <laughs> okay. And then, um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to close up saying, you know, if somebody does not have access but needs the actual PDF, um, it's just like unlocking it. We can access the, you know, we can generate the PDF of the of the VHEP profile as the home currently stands, right? Um, so, sorry. So, 
Yeah, so this is the kind of question that would be addressed in the guide. And that is, I mean, what, so this is, this is a good question, right? So if there was um, a challenge or a contention about that, I think we could come up with a process for, um, these are the documents that you would need to provide. And, uh, you know, if you were able to, to show that, then, um, you know, then we can facilitate uh, the unlocking. Um, but that's, um, that's something that we can put on our radar for further discussion with the, with the committee. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, any further questions, clarifying questions? Okay. Um, all right. So I, we're going to um, open this up for public comment now. Um, and Susan Labarth, I see your hand there. You've been very patient. Thank you. Excellent. So um, you're going to go first here, but I also just want to clarify again, um, if anyone wants to make a comment, uh, you can either use the raise hand function, which is under reactions, um, or you can turn on your camera and just physically wave and we'll get you in the order, or you can unmute yourself and just let us know that you would like to speak. Um, so uh, Susan, you are up first. Go ahead. Okay, thank you um, for accommodating me. Um, I got myself a little better organized. I, I was aware that I ranted emotionally last time. Um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the time and energy that has been put into this um, by the committee and, and by the council. Um, but I do have some remaining questions and concerns. Um, I want to thank Veronique. Have I said your name right? <laughs> Yeah, um, for the slide that she shared with us, I think it was hers, in, in which she she did partially address some of my questions, and maybe that'll be obvious. Um, I'm particularly referring to um, this is just a quote from the materials that are in the packet on page 91 out of uh, 206. Good heavens, do you guys read through all that? Um, anyway. So the, 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 um, the thing in the packet that says, and I think this is a summary of, of the presentations, um, why should I trust the VHEAP methodology? VHEAP has been developed and tested through a multi-year process involving various stakeholders, including a focus group of residents. The automated energy model behind VHEAP has been studied and found to be comparable to other industry accepted energy usage and cost estimation models. Okay. Um, I'd like to know, uh, has the um, council uh, been privy to or been provided the details of those actual studies, um, the data uh, demonstrating validity, reliability of the tool itself and or of the algorithm that underlies it, including the method used, the number of subjects and the data analysis. I'm a physician. Drug rep tells me, oh, this is gonna save lives. You need to prescribe it. That's not enough for me. Um, I do look at the studies and, and what the level of evidence is. And, and we have a rating system. Is this A, B, C, or D? Um, is it based on, a, um, a, what do they call it? A, a, um, controlled study, anyway. That might be difficult with the kind of stuff that we're dealing with, but um, I'd be more comfortable if I knew that something had been done along those lines, in particular with how many subjects. Um, in addition, studies with data demonstrating the outcomes of use of the tool, the benefits and the harms. Okay, not just this is going to cure your cancer, but are you going to throw up or die earlier? Um, in terms of um, this particular project, um, is it going to, in fact, decrease Montpelier's CO2 output or, or some other environmental benefit? And, and, and what will be the harms to homeowners, um, 
or buyers or real estate agents or uh, the, what's the, the guy that's going to manage my estate when I move to Greenmount Cemetery. Um, the harms possibly to the municipality or to the environment. Once again, methods, number of subjects, data analysis. Has the council been privy to this kind of information? Do we really have a clear idea of what we're getting into and what we're prescribing to the community? That's my question. Um, those are my main questions. Um, I do have some problems with the energy tool itself, aside from validity and reliability and reproducibility and all of that business. Um, it took me over a month to get into the website. I kept getting these cute little error messages. Sorry, something went wrong. We're working on it. Um, and, and that's, um, and, and then you're going to be paying fines because you haven't filed for six weeks. I don't remember what your fine structure was, but what's that going to add up to? Um, and then, uh, it took me the better part of two hours to get to the point where I thought it was anywhere as near accurate in terms of my particular house. Um, it took me about half an hour to just do the, the, the part that was kind of whatever you call it, the standard home that was built in 1904 in Montpelier, what have you. Um, and that initial thing came up uh, more than $1,200 more than my actual energy expenses, more than $1,200. When I spent another hour tracking down some of the, first of all, figuring out where to click and where that little pencil was that allowed me to change things and how to get to that. Um, then it was tracking down some of the data you know, what was the R value on the stuff that was sprayed into my attic? God, I have no idea. I could probably figure that out, but that would take me another couple of hours. I'd have to contact the contractor that did that. But wait a minute. He's retired. I don't know. Where do I start? I, where would my son start when he goes to sell the house after I've moved to Greenmount? I, 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 he'd have no idea. He would he would be almost I think forced to use the standard model without my specific details. Now I have to admit that well, I've been in the house for over thirty years. I've owned the house for over thirty years, so I've done a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. There's not even an option to enter the actual heating and air conditioning methodology that I use, which is geothermal. I have a well in my backyard here in Montpelier for a geothermal water heat pump. And it's not there. Um, so, you know, at that point, I'm to the point where I have to go find where you put in how much your electric bills were. So I have to go to the banking website and search all my checks, oh, geez, um, or my credit card, you know, whichever thing it is. And I, I mean, anyway, so I had a lot of trouble getting it from uh, somebody, and I, can't, I, I don't remember who it was, but somebody showed us a screenshot of that report where it has the arrow where your home lies. It has an arrow up top, and it's green at one end and right at the other end. It started out when I did the standard thing, my, the arrow was right in the middle. I got it all the way down into the green zone by putting in all my own stuff. But it was, um, it was a difficult process and I can't imagine my son having to do that. So he would be faced with a presenting to the realtor or the buyer 10 or 20, I hope, years from now, whatever the standard thing is, because it just, I, he, I, <laughs> if it was me, I'd just throw up my hands and say, that's it, I'm done. 
Um, so anyway, I'm sorry, I rambled on again. I promised you I wouldn't do that, didn't I? So let's see, I had listed here the areas that I had found it difficult or that it did not allow me at all to enter actual details. I mentioned the geothermal. It was difficult to find out how to change my, my water heater fuel to propane, correct the information about my attic, my basement, their insulation, the correct information about the refrigerator, the stove, the dryer, which are both gas, and it can indicate that all my light bulbs were LEDs. It pops up automatically mixed. <sighs> all right, sorry I threw in the, I, I started to rant again. I apologize for that. In summation, um, while I acknowledge the good intentions underlying this proposal, I really don't see complete objective evidence that will achieve the effects attended. And a result, as a result, I see it as an example of citizen harassment. I'm sorry, but I do. Um, which will add costs, though probably small, to city administration and to the homeowners. And I urge the city council to table it until data is available to support its efficacy and until the tool is refined to more accurately reflect actual home energy use. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, Joey. Well, hello, and thank you for the opportunity to comment. Um, this might um, be sort of um, a mind bending pivot from the comments you just received, which I appreciate a lot of what you just shared, Susan, but I just wanna um, start by saying um, I have I have a different view of the importance of this small but important step and and just really appreciating the the, the work that you have put into exploring essentially giving people fundamental information about their homes um, which we expect and demand when we're talking about you know looking at a miles per gallon sticker in our car so I I really appreciate I think about Susan's thinking about her son on her way to Green Mount. I'm thinking about my daughter who's nine years old and um, the, the small but important steps we need to be making to become more energy literate. And when we're talking about selling our homes and giving people a sense of the energy costs and the opportunity to reduce those energy costs and also to um, think about that at the point of sale. I mean, we're, I mean, this this is, a, again, I just want to underscore what I think. This is a very, um, I appreciate the really thoughtful consideration that's going into this, and clearly more time needs to be um, taken to work out some of the kinks. So I appreciate there's a little bit of a lag time before any fines are, um, you know, you know, like established, um, and more work will need to be done to protect privacy and really sort of unpack and um address some of the concerns that have been raised already. Um, but it strikes me that, um, you know, this is really crucial information to be giving, you know, potential buyers um, of homes. Uh, I, I just think we, you know, we've committed to net zero as a city. I'm proud of that living here. Um, I think it's fundamentally important, especially at the point of sale, to give people an assessment so that they can make informed decisions about what they're entering into in terms of the cost of the home and the opportunities that they may have in front of them to access some of the incentives or the programs that the state of Vermont offers to um, reduce fossil fuel consumption, which is again, not only good for people's pocketbooks, but good for the planet. And when I think about um, you know, my daughter and young people and future generations, this seems like one small but fundamental step forward to again give people information in sort of in a transparent way and i appreciate underscoring the opportunity and the need to work out the kinks and really dig into the considerations that people are raising but fundamentally i really hope that you continue to move forward um, in in embracing this um, as a city of montpelier and also recognizing um, i work on energy issues i i think that you know voluntary approaches are, are nice and they may seem less onerous, but ultimately to do what we need to do, um, I think we're, you know requirements are going to be essential and this seems like a, a, a really important step forward. So thank you for the thorough work that you have done to date and for the ongoing work 
that you will do to address some of the very legitimate concerns that you have heard tonight. Thank you. Steve Whitaker waiting in the queue. Uh, go ahead, Stephen. There's no one ahead of you. Uh, I, my comments are, are, are better informed, but not much different than last time. Um, that this is not, this is half-baked. This is not ready for prime time. There are some of the smarter people who commented saying that this is uh, not ready for implementation uh, or adoption. Um, I think you really need to get off the, uh, you know, self pat on your back, politically correct nonsense that's driving this. We've got major serious issues with infrastructure around town and public restrooms, et cetera. So we're, you know, we're scratching, you know, we're doing hot tub peacock feathers here and it's nonsense. Uh, the privacy issues are real. Uh, I remind you of vital uh, being a nonprofit housing the data of all our medical records. Uh, I took them to court and they, well, they were deemed to be subject to public records law. And so I'm pretty sure that there's case law, not being a lawyer, I'm pretty sure there's case law that says you can't, uh, I'd like to know the name of the attorney that you relied on to say you can just offshore it uh, by saying we don't have possession of it and that that would stand up in court. Um, you happen to know the name of that attorney that advised you that? Madam Mayor? Yes, but you, you can continue your comments. I'll address them all at the end. You will name the attorney? Because, uh, but anyway, the, the, the complications of this, I think if the, the citizens that want to sell their house uh, at a premium can pay for an energy audit and get it done properly by a professional, this is kind of a do-it-yourself, uh, you know, average and generalized, even the 30-day lockout. You know, I like uh, that, that somebody else can capture your profile on the 31st day. It's just, it's comic how half-baked this is. While the intentions are good, I understand the intentions are good, and someday it may be ready, it may be a public service, it may be something that the League of Cities and Towns hosts and keeps secure for all its member municipalities. But to, to be going about it the way we are, I have to agree with the person that called it citizen harassment. Um, but yes, uh, this one would be fun to shut down uh, through court action if necessary, uh, because of I can see what's pushing it and the lack of readiness for prime time. It is. Okay, thank you. Uh, Peter. Okay. Um, I prepared some remarks, which I'll deliver some of, um, I, I, but I'm gonna have to deviate because of some of the um, opening statements that were presentations that were made. Um, I, I definitely applaud some of the changes that have been made to the ordinance, uh, namely the uh, elimination of the aspirational paragraphs in section 21.1 regarding purpose, particularly the unsupported assertions regarding consumer protection. I'm glad you got rid of that. And also that you tried to figure out the legally problematic section. I'm not a lawyer, so it sounded a little gnarly to me, but maybe you've got to figure it out. Um, the most interesting one to me is the uh, delaying the penalties until January 2020. Um, I, I have a question. I, you don't need to answer it now, but I hope somebody's thinking about what does that actually mean? Supposing I put my house for sale on December 31st or December 1st or October 1st, mm -hmm. and it hasn't sold by January 1st, and I didn't fill this thing out. Well, I started the process before I didn't sell it. Now am I gonna get penalized because I didn't, I'm not sure what that cutoff actually means legally. So I hope someone's gonna figure that out. But the, the idea of the delay is a good one, a very good one, provided that you really are able to do the things that you are going to need to do to make this ordinance work. Now I've sent you guys 
lots of emails about suggesting things, and I heard some responses that seemed to be, quote, answering me. I'm not looking for answers. I'm trying to get you to do the right thing. I'm going to just give you one very good example. Lauren, I'm glad you brought it up with C. Jack. I sent, the, I sent information to C. Jack for months about this, never got a response. However, I want you to notice that your harms were all focused on the buyer. You did not address the harm to the seller, and you did not address seniors. I'm going to tell you right now, there are a hundred seniors who are going to have to sell their homes in the next five to 10 years. And these people, and I think Susan Labarth gave you an idea of the frustration that she's considering. I tried to use this um, to, to, to uh, to, to on our old, our home that we're selling right now. And boy, am I glad that we're selling it before this goes into place, because this is, it is impossible, I think as Ben Hoffman uh, showed us, it's impossible to actually input stuff that is accurate. And it leaves you with either having that sort of, taking all the numbers that Veronique showed us that come from this, national database and this national database and this national database. But this national database is not necessarily a reflection of Montpelier at all, and certainly not of my home or Ben's home or, or Susan's home. And when seniors are in a situation where they have to sell their house, this is going to harm them. And I think you guys have to, got to take some very, very serious look at mitigation for seniors. You really need to think about that. And I also think you need to think about you saying, oh, well, uh, low, in, low income people are, are, are most of are many of the buyers and BIPOC. That is true. But until there's more than a pilot program with VSECU to knock off half a point, think about the real problem of affordable housing in this town. And think about the fact that this ordinance is going to drive up prices of everything in this town. Because the people who can afford to do this, like me, are going to do it. Oh, and here's the dirty word, voluntarily. We're going to do it. And our houses are going to increase in value and people who cannot afford to do it. Notice how few people are here today. And I, and I can tell you, I talk to people every day who are low income, or moderate income, and I tell them about this, and they just shake their head in disbelief and fear. But they're not here. They don't have time to be here. They're trying to hold their lives together. And I think CJAC needs to go back and not just think about young people and the buyers. Think about the sellers. Think about the pressure that this brings. Now, I'm not going to go. I, I, I had a whole section like Susan's. These studies, and Ann sent me so these studies that, uh, I think four or five studies, and I looked into them. These studies are non-comparable. They do not apply to our situation. Most of them are for new construction. We're not talking about new construction here. And, and when they're not with new construction, they're using things like HERS and, uh, and um, LEADS other completely different uh, instruments. This instrument, this v VHEP, was developed for Vermont, not for Montpelier, and you guys are making changes in it. This instrument has not been tested. Oh yeah, you had some focus groups. Listen, I was in publishing for 20 years. I published software for 15 years. I would have been fired if I tried to publish a program or put out a textbook based on focus groups. Focus groups give you general guidance. They do not give you the kind of testing you have to put this thing through. I went through this thing with my wife, who was an editor, and we tried to figure this out. That interface has so many flaws in it. I, 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 if an editor brought this to me, I would have said, come back when you've made it 
close to being acceptable. This needs a lot of work. Where is the plan to, I don't want you to tell me, oh, we did this, we did this, we did this. You need to do more. You need to do much more. And as for Efficiency Vermont answering questions or NEEP answering questions, we tried to, we, we had the same problem that Susan did. We couldn't get on. Finally, we got to Veronique, I, I don't know how, and she did some magic fix and we got it, got on. Do you know what the magic fix was, it turned out? Because my wife asked. Some programmer in her company got us mixed up with another program. That's the kind of startup problem, human error that is bound to happen. And that's why I told that little story in the beginning of the meeting about how my ride was developed slowly over time with genuine stakeholder involvement. We had people on those buses talking to the present riders, finding out from them what their fears were, what their issues were, what wasn't working for them, what, what, what was working for them. Because we were replacing their regular routes with this route. And we made changes to, and we made via a much bigger, much more experienced technology company than um, Clear Energy. And we showed them how their model that they've had in Copenhagen and here and here and here and here wasn't working here. And, you know, Ann says, oh, well, we have to be careful about Montpelier exceptionalism. I'm not talking about exceptionalism. I'm talking about each place is unique. And we need a program that will work here and has to be tested here and has to be tested in high stakes situation. Having a few people, you know, you go through this who are already predisposed to this, to, to this, uh, using this um, tool and giving ad hoc suggestions is not the same as testing it out with real people having to sell their homes. And I would strongly propose that instead of having a delay of this ordinance, you change it and have a program that will be studied and encourage people to participate voluntarily, help them through the process, and they will help you to redesign the instrument appropriately. But if you just say, oh, you know, for the next six months, we just want to enforce this, that's not going to get you the right group to do, do testing with. So I just have to say, I'm more discouraged by hearing these defenses, hearing Donna assure me that Jasmine and, you know, and, 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 and the overworked uh, public works department is going to be able to answer the questions. I have about 50 questions. Who am I going to talk to? Veronique about this. Deep about you know we called efficiency Vermont. They didn't even know. They didn't even recognize the the word VATP. I hope you guys understand that you've bitten off more than you can chew. You need to delay this. You need to run this as a voluntary program. Sorry, I didn't mean to sound like Steve Whitaker. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, Susan, I see you've got your hand, but I want to make sure that anybody who hasn't spoken yet has the opportunity to. Um, so anyone else who has not yet spoken like to weigh in? Hi. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, Peter, I see you. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, yeah, for some reason, my hand doesn't raise, or the hands that I sent you, you didn't see. Um, so Peter Tucker, I'm a, uh, a resident of North Park Drive in Montpelier and uh, also work for the Vermont Association of Realtors as their Director of Advocacy and, and Public Affairs. And I've been involved for the past year with, uh, with the statewide um, you know, programs to develop uh, of, you know, this similar system. Um, and I've, I've learned a good deal about it. Um, one thing I've learned tonight is I actually know, I think a quarter of the people who have uh, tested this program, because uh, I am aware that you know around 16 folks were in the, the Montpelier focus group um, 
And, you know, you've heard from some residents that were able to get through it and uh, get on the profile. And I think their, you know, their results are, are you know, kind of indicative. Um, I was able to log in, you know, claim my home and, uh, and log into the profile, you know, not an incredible amount of difficulty. Um, what I wanted to see was how this, this system works with, um, with kind of the default uh, settings that it has. Um, you know, as we know, City of Montpelier provided a lot of information to uh, NEEP uh, to, to populate uh, through public records, uh, tax records. Um, so when, when I, uh, I called up that default profile, um, you know, and I looked at it and I said, boy, I mean, you know, I'd have to change this and I've got to change that. There were 13 fields um, that I felt like I would have to correct before the profile even started to represent uh, my home. Um, you know, it's a combination of public records and assumptions. Um, but you, I think that, that the majority of that public record information is going into or is part of that algorithm that defines a home. Um, whether or not the owner uh, creates additional inputs in their profile. Um, so, you know, I, you know, my experience has been that, that this, uh, this system has uh, a number of, you know, a number of issues with uh, the records that it's, it's working off of. Um, something I can tell you is that um, this, this profile cannot auto-populate our multiple listing service system. Um, there's something in the software design of our, our multiple listing service that, that doesn't allow for auto population. Um, so that is, you know, that's just another kind of, you know, one of the, the challenges of the, of the profile. Um, we worked hard at the state level um, to protect the privacy of, of owners who did enter information into the profile. Uh, it's very important from our perspective that uh, that information is made available only if the owner uh, wants to make that information available. If this ordinance becomes mandatory, that, you know, it's kind of taken out of their hands, as we saw, you know, the checkbox really wouldn't apply um, because they would be forced, whether they wanted to or not, to provide this information. Um, you know, the realtors, uh, and I have had uh, continual conversations with brokers in, uh, in Montpelier, and I'm sure you'll hear from at least one uh, later, um, you know, are, are really concerned about the ability of this profile to represent properties accurately. Um, and they, they oppose, uh, you know, the creation of this ordinance, um, you know, and it's very clear to me that, they, you know, they feel strongly about that. Um, just a, a couple of other thoughts that I've had, you know, after the first, uh, the first hearing, um, you know, applying this to uh, for sale by owner properties is going to be extremely challenging for the city. Um, you know, our multiple listing service publicly available, anyone can go on and, and take a look and see what's there. Um, some some for sale by owner, um, you know, uh, websites are, are available, but there'll be many that that you just don't you're not aware of. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, why, do, why are realtors concerned about this? And, and the real reason is that we work with property owners every day. Um, and, you know, it, we work with buyers as well as sellers. But, you know, I think the, the point that's been made here this evening is that, that there are sellers of older, uh, vulnerable uh, sellers or, or older properties that are just not going to do well, you know, in an energy profile analysis. Um, I agree that the uh, you know the statement of purpose uh, reducing that or, or you know really taking most of that information out uh, was probably a smart thing to do, um, you know because at one point it did say you know this is for buyers to uh, properly price uh, properties, um, you know having spent 25 years as a broker, I know that what that means is that buyers are going to use it as a negotiating tool to get a lower price on the property from a seller who may not be able to either make those improvements or be able to afford that loss of equity in their property. So, you know, that's why, that's why we're here. That's why, uh, you know, I, Tim Haney's on the call. Um, and that's why we're concerned about it. It is, it does have an impact on your community. It's an impact on, you know, your constituents, the voters of the community. And if it's not working uh, incredibly well, um, now is not the right time to, uh, to enact this ordinance. Um, so, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Peter. 
Um, anyone else who has not yet spoken want to jump in? Okay, um, seeing no one else, um, Susan, if you want to go again, now is okay. Um, um, uh, Peter's comments just stimulated a couple of thoughts in my mind um, that I kind of wanted to follow up on. Um, uh, if, if you want my bona fides for elderly, I'm 78 years old, um, but um, I had the first Apple computer that was commercially available and I've dealt with electronic medical records for over 20 years. So I, I'm not, I, I'm not an IT idiot. Um, and, and it took me upwards of two hours to get this thing to where I thought it truly reflected my home. Um, with regard to uh, the cost and your lower income um, sellers, um, my home improvements have been all voluntary and probably way ahead of the curve. Um, in terms of cost, probably about $100,000. The uh, geothermal alone was $30,000 and that was, well, I can't even remember, maybe 10 years ago. I, don't re I, I can't say the year, maybe more than 10. Um, I've had one service call that cost me $5,000. Um, because of a problem with the well. And that's um, probably not sustainable for some people. So may, maybe you're not expecting people to go as far as I have, but I'm not all the way down at the green end, even so I'm just a little bit into the green. So there's that, there's the cost of, of um, responding if someone wants to uh to to the report that they generate through this tool okay and uh the last thing i want to say is much more simple please stop comparing it to miles per gallon for god's sake that's two numbers that's two numbers there's no algorithm it's miles divided by gallons two numbers it's not a complicated thing like this. The end, thank you. Um, just wanna check again if there's anybody, oh, uh, Ben Huffman, go ahead. I had um, thought I would not make any comments because I know I've made my points uh, pretty clear, I hope, but I, I guess I can't resist. Uh, particularly with uh, Veronica, I don't know how to pronounce her name. Veronique? Is Veronique. That Say it again. It's Veronique. Veronique, okay. Um, two things I want to raise. One is simply that selling a home, buying a home is all about specifics, about very concrete circumstances. And um, there is no way that the score on the, uh, through this algorithm is going to address the questions, the multitude of questions about a home, which are really what's important. And uh, as you know, Anne, I had about a year ago, the, interest in trying to develop basically an alternative to all this through using public monies to um, assist people to actually collect genuine data through uh, professional audits. And um, I made a real effort to, to get information from energy efficiency. They were, it was a zero, they had nothing. And, um, the point here is that what's clear to me is that if we're going to make headway on dealing with the climate situation, there are going to have to be a lot of bona fide energy office done so that people can then make the investments and the improvements that are required to reduce the emissions. And um, 
if in fact a thorough, complete professional audit, including the scan and the air infiltration can be had for roughly $400. I see no reason why that should not be what is mandated at the point where something is offered for sale with the cost of that shared by both the seller and the buyer. I mean, when you think about doing a title search or any number of other things that are entailed in a real estate transaction and think that providing information about energy consumption is of such paramount importance that it needs to be mandated in the way that this would propose to do. It makes perfect sense to me to approach it in the same manner through the help of professional experts and gaining the experience, which would be of real value to a buyer who would want to know what it is that's going to require to be spent in order to have the kind of energy efficiency in this home that I might desire. And um, I guess there's no point in, you know, pursuing it further. It looks like there's no opportunity whatsoever to, in this current proposal, to do something other than go through the mystery algorithm. And so I um, will just say I'm disappointed in my city taking this kind of approach and um, leave it at that. Thank you. Um, other comments from any, anyone who has not spoken yet? Okay. And Peter, did you want to make a second comment? Yeah, yeah. Let me just make a, a couple of uh, slightly more positive comments. Um, I, I think there's some things that, that, that we need to take a look at. For example, I'm surprised some of the real estate people didn't point this out. There's no Montpelier real estate market. There's a central Vermont, greater Montpelier uh, uh, market. And, and some of the materials that have, have talked about le a level playing field. Well, how is it a level playing field if Montpelier sellers need to do this and East Montpelier sellers don't? You, we need to think about the fact that, like the governor says, we're not an island. Montpelier is not an island either. Uh, the second thing is, and I'm sure, I, I know there are politics behind this, but come on, if we are serious about wanting buildings to be greener, how about the commercial buildings? Why is, it, why is this only for residents? Why? Because we're more vulnerable. We don't, we don't have the clout, okay? But you guys, if you guys are serious about this, you need to turn to the commercial uh, uh, owners of commercial property and say, this is going to apply to you too. And the third thing, and I've mentioned this a number of times, how about waiting and seeing what's going to happen with the Green New Deal? The feds and the state may really have some answers for us that are going to be more than about 100 houses a year, which is really anemic. Um, and then the last thing I want to say is, and those are all positive. Let's wait and find out what happens. Let's talk about this as a regional approach. And let's get the commercial properties under, under the same kind of uh, treatment. But, and by the way, on these studies, the, the materials that you guys showed us last week alone in the presentation, the, the, the VHEP has been used and, and similar tools have been used almost exclusively in non-mandatory settings. Look at the map of the very, very, very few places in the country that have done mandatory and ask yourselves why. And I think a lot of the problems that we've been talking about here would go away if this was voluntary. And I'm sorry, but voluntary does work. And we do not have, Lauren, we do not have decades of evidence that voluntary measures don't work. Are they enough? Probably not. But is this are these 100 homes enough? Absolutely not. Because I don't think the answers are anywhere in what a municipality is going to do. 
They are what the federal government is going to do, what the state government is going to do, what countries are going to do together in Paris Accord kind of things, and they're in the hearts of individuals. And the hearts of individuals not only include caring about the future for our kids, about you know the climate, they also care about sending our kids to college. They also care about putting food on the table. There are lots of things that people's, people care about. And making them feel like criminals because they haven't filled this thing out, that language is so punitive. It's, it, it's disturbing. It really is disturbing. When you make something a law and have penalties associated with it, you make people who feel that they can't do it feel like criminals. It's blaming the victim. All right, I'm going to shut up. OK, thanks, Peter. Um, anyone else? Uh, yeah, I, I'll just say here, here to that person and say, I didn't want to sound like Peter. <laughs> OK, anyone else? OK, all right. So thank you, everybody. Um, there are a few things I wanted to just um, uh, comment on. So thank you for those comments. Those were those were great um, and, and helpful. Uh, and so I, I want to clarify just a couple of things. And there were some folks asked some questions, so I thought I would um, answer what I can anyway. Um, so uh, one thing, uh, so Susan, you asked about um, how will this affect CO2 in Montpelier and the studies that we have, there have multi been multiple studies on this sort of thing, and this is really why we've um, pursued this in the first place. Um, the studies that we've seen uh, show that between, depending on the study, between 12 and 37% of home buyers end up making energy improvements to the home that they were otherwise not planning on making. Um, so that, that was very encouraging to us, uh, but I'm also happy to, to share those studies with you if that um, is useful. I also thought it was really interesting that they didn't have the option for a, a geothermal uh, heat pump for water. I feel like that's really valuable um, information to know and something that um, can or, or should be uh, incorporated into um, the process. Um, uh, there was a question about who our lawyer was, um, that is uh, Joseph McLean. Um, and there was a question about when, you know, if, if like, let's say this kicks in, um, you know, there's a, a date that, uh, where things, you know, where either penalties kick in or it's, it starts to be mandatory. Um, my understanding is that there would not be any provision for like being grandfathered in if it was listed previously. It's, it's, if, if it's being listed at that date that you would, um, then be required to, um, to do the, uh, the profile. Um, there was another, uh, oh, there was one thing that I wanted to, to point out that I'm not sure, I, I, I think we might have said it in the comments at the beginning, but I wanted to make sure we made it really clear. Um, we've also added uh, a comments section. So if in the end people uh, enter their, their data, and let's say, you know, there, there just ends up being something ultimately very weird about the house or it's just something really unusual um, that uh, we've added a, a comment section so that the seller could uh, could specify that they could say you know well I, I don't think these numbers are quite right because um, because blank so it's an opportunity for the seller to make any um, kind of um, comments about anything particularly about the house um, so just wanted to make sure that I had clarified that. Um, all right. So, any, any? I guess that's that's it for that. Any other folks from the committee want to address any comments or respond to anything? Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, council, uh, what are what are your thoughts? How do you want to proceed? Uh, Dan, go ahead. Sure. Um, <clears throat> well, I want to I, I want to thank the committee for adopting a number of those changes because they've mirrored a lot of my concerns, and I think they've taken care of 
uh, some of the issues that I had removing the intent section, um, eliminating the actual recording of this sheet in lieu of a certification sheet. Um, I think these all deal with this. But um, the one issue that I guess I would push is that I, I would urge um, that we consider making this voluntary for a full year as opposed to six months um, in order. And, and, and the argument that I would make in favor of it is um, about three points. First, um, I think a full year's data uh, of home transactions gives us a better picture of the number of sales, the voluntary versus involuntary compliance, the issues people have, um, as well as the, um, the troubles or evolution of this. Um, and I think this is one of these ordinances that we're looking to make long-term changes. And so the idea of an additional six months of voluntary compliance, I think gives it a full and true run. The other reason I, I believe that uh, extending it to a, a full year for voluntary compliance, as opposed to six months is sensible, is that uh, I do think that we are hitting the, the tip of the iceberg on a number of these issues that, you know, these are things that we're seeing as we're sitting here at our desks reviewing this. And I think in actual practice, there'll be additional ones and so, you know, giving it that extra six months, I think gives it that extra six months of protection to uh, work through some of these issues uh, so that we don't end up um, penalizing homeowners who are selling and going through this for the first time. The third is, is that I, I think it also addresses the remaining concerns and issues that we've talked about, whether it be opportunity for the Green New Deal to come in, or um, the idea that the state is working on something similar and maybe catching up. Um, that gives another legislative session for them to do that. Um, and it gives us an opportunity to, um, you know, have that click on uh, from voluntary to mandatory after that legislative session, but give us the opportunity to pull back if, if the state legislature and the realtors were to come up with something better. Um, for those reasons, I think, adding that extra six months seems sensible. Um, I don't think it takes away from the impact of this ordinance, uh, gives us a bit of a safety buffer, allows some of the testing that's been alleged to have either occurred or not occurred to really be settled once and for all, um, but also gives people a year long heads up to say this is coming. And if so, if somebody is feeling very motivated not to participate in this, it gives them a year um, to make decisions in that respect. Um, and I think it would give us an opportunity in, in the next spring um, to, to look at, you know, eight months of data about this and to see, you know, whether or not voluntary compliance works um, or whether there should be a mandatory element uh, or whether this is so successful, of course it should be mandatory because it's, it's a wonderful tool everybody's using. I, I think it builds in all those possibilities, but stops us from having the situation that I think a number of the commentators were were concerned about. So that that's my big pitch. I think most of the other concerns um, could either be classified as I think changes to the form as it evolves, such as removing the homeowner verified um, plate when no one when you haven't as a homeowner actually verified any of that information. I think is a really important change but it sounds like something that can easily be evolved over time with the, uh, with the committee. Um, I think the dealing with the sort of squatter issue is more complicated than um, any of us realize um, just because, and I'll, I'll give an example, you know, in divorce cases all the time, you see this where one person doesn't want to sell the home and they're on it and they squat on it and the other person is really motivated to sell, it becomes yet another block in that fight. And I know that that's not something that's necessarily, that's going to exist anyway. And that exists for a number of other issues that we as a city deal with. We don't stop recording deeds because of that problem, for example. Um, but it's something is going to have to be addressed along the time. And I think it further uh, illustrates giving us a year sort of breathing room to check in and see how this works, allows those type of problems to filter through in that first year. So th that's my strong pitch to give this a year 
and I think I could support this ordinance uh, in passage with that year. Um, but without, I, I, I think a number of these issues, it, it, six months strikes me as just, from my own personal point of view, too short. Thanks. Thank you. Jay, go ahead. Um, yeah, I would just uh, take, I, I, I absolutely agree with Dan on giving it a year. I think that there are um, a number, uh, a, we, we've heard from plenty of folks, there's a lot of issues um, that, that need to be worked out. Um, having, you know, launched a couple apps and a number of websites, I mean, having a strong beta period is, gives you real world information into how, into how something like this will live and breathe in the community or whether it's, it's for a homeowner or a potential consumer or whatever, but you've got to put it in people's hands and then learn from that process and then, uh, and then adjust and adapt and make it work for them. It, it's not all, it, it'll never work for everyone, but you've got to sort of, it's got to go beyond more than just a small focus group. And there is good data and there, there are a lot of energy has been put into this, but it's got to sort of get out in the wild so we can learn from it. And, and I would take Dan's, actually Dan's comment in terms of supporting this and moving forward tonight it, a little bit further in that what I think what we should do is commit to a feedback, feedback loop structure that we say, um, you know, first off, I wouldn't wait to July 1st to make it available, make it available tomorrow. You know, Tim's on the call. He'll tell you, I mean, I know year over year things are different, but summer is the time, right, for, for real estate in Vermont generally, right? So, I mean, I know the market is what it is now, but, you know, transactions are happening. So, we should get it out there now and then create a structure where on November 1st, we have an opportunity to say, okay, this is what we've learned. This is who we need to engage with. We need to engage with realtors, with homeowners, uh, with sellers, with buyers. We need to understand, have they used it? If not, why not? Um, what did they learn from the process? And then we take that in, we say, okay, all right, now we've got six weeks, we're gonna adjust the tool. We're, this is what we've learned. And this is, we're gonna um, put out a new version on, you know, the beginning of 2022, we're gonna go through the same thing in the spring and then we're gonna launch it and require it moving forward um, based on that feedback. So I, I just, I strongly support the idea behind the, the work and um, I, 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 you know, what, what I heard that really resonated to me is the importance of um, making sure that homeowners are energy literate that they understand what, you know, the impacts of these decisions that they make um, in their homes uh, and, and can convey those and, and, under, and understand those. But I, I do feel like something like this, that is something is of a behavioral change, like Donna alluded to, um, is something that needs to be out and be um, used in the real world for at least two rounds of, or at least one solid, maybe two rounds of feedback before we can, um, before we're in a position to, to fully re uh, require it. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Jack, go ahead. Oh, Jack, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Um, I've received a bunch of communications from people at home and heard and listened to all the comments that uh, we've had at the meetings. And it strikes me that uh, they come down to three major categories. One is that, uh, as Peter Kelman mentioned tonight, this ordinance will not in itself be sufficient to address the important issue of climate change and that more uh, action is going to be necessary. And of course that's correct. For instance, I would like to see us be able to apply this to commercial buildings, but that is not the authority we have from the legislature at present. Um, and hopefully as we implement this ordinance and we show that it's successful, that will give us uh, ammunition to argue for expansion 
to uh, to commercial business sales. Um, second, we've heard a lot of comments about how this ordinance isn't going to be as good as we hope it will be. The, the algorithm that uh, which I, I don't I still don't consider algorithm to be a, a scary word, but uh, the the methodology may not give a perfect reflection of the energy uses or energy uh, costs of a of a property, and um, so it's not worth doing because we're not going to get perfect data. Um, and it's, I assume that that's true, that the data is not going to be perfect. But I don't think that uh, the fact that this process, this project and program isn't going to deliver perfect data is really enough to say that we shouldn't pass the ordinance at all. Uh, I think that already this, the changes we've seen, uh, mostly not in the ordinance, mostly in the in the instrument, are uh, are already moving us to a better place than we started in. And finally, we've heard suggestions that uh, this ordinance will impose severe harmful effects on uh, on sellers, particularly on minorities, old people, and other disadvantaged segments of the community. And I've tried to understand where this comes from, and I really don't agree with that. First off, this ordinance doesn't require anybody to do anything except some basic reporting. It does not require anyone to do any energy efficiency improvements to a house they're trying to sell. Um, second, it's true that there may be people who have trouble registering and filling out the information. Now, I didn't find it that hard, but uh, I probably have a more typical energy use profile in some people, and so that, that could be why. But I think uh, the people who say, well, this is just going to be too hard for unsophisticated users, unsophisticated sellers to, uh, to manage are overlooking the fact that uh, in most cases in Montpelier, sales or real estate sales are handled by, uh, by real estate agents. And they're going to be working with their clients to make sure that these, that the property is registered and, uh, and everything's filled out correctly, just the way real estate agents work with the, their clients to make sure that the lead paint disclosure is done. So they could be doing it entirely or they could be working with their clients, but I think it's going to be done. And, and the, the third point on this is that if the opponents of the ordinance think that sellers who can't afford to make energy improvements will be disadvantaged in the market, I would say that that is a result of market conditions and not a consequence of the proposed ordinance. So for all those reasons, I think we should be mo moving forward on this. I think there are some uh, provisions related to uh, <clears throat> data privacy that we should build into the uh, contract that we're going to have to enter into with the vendor to uh, before we roll this out. But uh, I agree with uh, with Dan and Jay that uh, having this uh, be voluntary for a year, probably a good change. But uh, for all those reasons, I will be uh, supporting this. Uh, Connor, go ahead. Sorry, Mayor, I'm cognizant of the time. It is 835. Did you oh. want me to speak before or after a break there? That's a great point. All we right. said at the beginning that we were going to take a break. 
at 8.30. Connor, can you hold your I can uh, indeed. Talk? For, Don, for Donna's sake, I can. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so, um, so we are going to take, uh, as advertised at the beginning of the meeting, we're going to take a 10-minute break. Um, and so we will be back here at uh, 8.45, since it is now 8.35. Um, and I will see you all then with Connor's comment. Okay. <laughs> um, and so we are going to pick up again here. Uh, and Connor, you had a comment, so go go right ahead. Yeah, no, sure. Thanks. I, I, first of all, I just want to thank everybody who uh, spoke tonight. You know, I, I think the comments so far have made this a better draft of an ordinance. And I, I think it's important to acknowledge uh, that, you know, in many cases, a person's home is their, their biggest asset. So anytime there's a measure taken that, you know, may affect the value, whether that's real or perceived, um, it's certainly going to cause some anxiety. Um, but that said, I do think we need to move forward with this ordinance. Um, you know, I, I look at someone like myself and, you know, to be honest, I'm not the best environmentalist. Like I recycle, I uh, bring the bag to the supermarket, but uh, just using this tool, it made me think of, you know, th things I didn't think before. And sure enough, I can't like, you know, if a, a special assessment came out with my condo association to put solar panels on the roof, I'm not sure I could afford it right now. Um, but I can certainly take some minor steps that this tool has guided me towards to replace appliances and start thinking about it. And maybe even more importantly, like start talking about it in the community. And it has generated some conversation. Um, you know, what Joey Miller was saying uh, kind of resonated with me. It's, you know, climate change is real and it's coming and we need to take steps to address it. And maybe that first, dress, uh, first step um, is actually getting all the information we need to make an intelligent decision, both as a city and somebody who's purchasing a home there. Um, so I, I think unless we do something, and this is a pretty minor step, um, but if we do something that does take people out, outside their comfort zones, and I think we need to do many more things like this, unless we do things like this, um, our net zero goals are nothing but a farce and a talking point. It's really true. Um, so I, I think we do need to take action. I think it does need to be provocative at times. Um, I, I think we do need to keep working on this and I think we need to continue keeping our thumb on the pulse of the community as this rolls out. Um, and for that reason, I, I, I think I would be supportive of um, moving it to a year voluntary before we do that. Uh, but even over that period, I think that does get the conversation going. And uh, you know, every step of the way, it does make this tool better. So I, I think it needs to be mandatory. I, I think it, it needs to happen. Um, again, appreciate everybody's concerns, um, but I, I think this is a good first step to take to, to, to start addressing some of these huge issues. Thanks. Um, thanks. Um, before, I, Jack, I see your hand, but um, I'm gonna let uh, Donna go first here. Uh, Donna, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, I mean, I really agree with what's been said and but I still have some things I'm a little confused about. I, I'm so um, sorry that people were so upset about this. I just see it as a positive step. And I like to see every household do it. I like to see every building do it. I see this as a beginning. I am concerned about the thousand dollars cap. I would feel more comfortable at five. And I would like the year volunteer, uh, being volunteer, bear voluntary um, to give time but I, I do feel like when you sell a house, you're asked for your fuel bills or at least a, a, a summation of them or your electrical bill. I mean, there are many things you're asked to put together already. And to me, this is just another tool. I, I don't think it'll be a big hammer, unfortunately, but I think it'll be a nudge to help us, all of us start looking at that. So it is a mindset, it is talking about it, it's stirring the pot. And I'm hoping it can stir the pot in a positive way and that we are mindful, whether it's me who gets confused on the computer or somebody else, that they can get assistance, they can call. In fact, right away, we could be very proactive, go to the senior center and say, you know, you have a lot of volunteers here. I bet you got some savvy IT people to help us introduce this to people. And we could really be uh, very active about it and not passive, even if it is voluntary. And I feel like the app, I made some comments, um, I missed one meeting that you talked about this before, but earlier on, I made comments how my frustration was that I couldn't put in exact usage. So 
they changed it. I, I went back in and there it was. I could put in my units instead of the bill because I'm on community solar. And so my bill is a flat $78 <laughs> versus the unit. So I was really glad to see right away that they did that. And as the mayor mentioned, they added the comment section that if you felt something wasn't quite right. So I think it can be better, but I think it has improved and everybody's comments has helped. I just hope people can maybe just take a breath and not be so intense about it. It's just one tool we're trying to use. Um, so if we'd go for the year voluntary and if we could change the cap to 500, I would support it. Thank you. Uh, Jack, go ahead. Oh, except for that you're muted again. Thank you, sorry about that. Yep, I, uh, I wanted to correct something I, I said earlier. I, I said that uh, we only have the authority from the legislature to do uh, residential buildings. Uh, Peter Kelman pointed out to me that in fact, we do have the authority to do uh, commercial properties too. And according to the legislation as signed by the governor. So that's, I, I feel that's, that's my fault there. Um, so yeah, thank you. <laughs> but I, but so I wanted to, uh, I, I would like to see us moving in, in that direction too, but uh, I didn't want to have that misstatement stand uncorrected. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Lauren, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I generally agree with what the um, the general sense of the council so far um, and really appreciate the input, even just hearing the firsthand experiences of what kinks people are still finding. Um, it's incredibly valuable. Um, you know, we've had the chance to address a number of them over the last month. And I think taking that extra time really helps to work through both policy issues and some of the technology issues. Um, and, you know, a lot of a lot of good and uh, valuable work's been going on in the background to try to really work through the issues. So, you know, you are being heard and appreciate people taking the time to provide really detailed, thoughtful comments from a variety of experiences. Um, you know, I do think that the delay um, of making this mandatory really gives time to address a lot of the additional concerns that we're hearing. Um, you know, some of these these other tweaks that might need to be made and really appreciated the way Jay was talking about it of a really deliberative process for feedback. So we make sure that if we're going to do a delay that we're learning and have a way to assess and make sure that we're implementing that really thoughtfully. Um, my, only kind of concern with the voluntary for the first year is how we're encouraging participation if it's really low or if only certain people who you know might want to tout the energy efficiency but you know the uh, improvements they've made to their house are the only ones participating is it really going to be um you know us learning all that we can i hope our realtors will be encouraging everybody to participate um you know maybe in a few months we look at what the percentage of homes that have been sold actually use the tool and can see um, you know how that the, that's going um, but really hope that um, you know all of us collectively as a community are taking that time to to, to really use it so that we can do the learning that um, we want to so we can continue to improve it um, you know and I know that uh, let's see I guess you know I, I, I guess I would just generally agree with the sense I'm I'm happy to support the um you know donna's proposal to cap the the max at 500 and to have it be the year um and you know just to reiterate connor's uh you know if we're gonna really achieve our net zero goals we've got a lot of changes coming and we need to get out of our comfort zone and try new things and you know take the time to learn from them i think you know we're constantly adjusting and looking at what the city is doing so i think moving forward and knowing that, you know, anything we do tonight isn't set in stone, we will learn, we will get better, um, but we need to be trying new things and the status quo isn't enough. So appreciate everyone really, really pushing and um, trying to do something new and pretty innovative. And I think, you know, it's just one small step that we need to take for climate, but I think it's an important one. Thanks. Great, yeah, thank you. Um, 
uh, I'm also going to chime in here, I suppose, uh, and um, say, first of all, I so appreciate all of you um, for taking the time to dig into this, uh, because this is maybe one of the most technical ordinances that we have, or that we don't have it yet, but um, but that we've ever talked about uh, as, as a group. Uh, you've uh, you've all been very patient uh, with this, and um, I really appreciate that. And you're you're digging into the details because it is kind of a, a very detail oriented um, uh, ordinance. So um, I just uh, yeah. So I'm also happy to support uh, you know changing the cap from a thousand dollars to five hundred. I think um, I think that's fine. Um, uh, just as far as uh, the delay goes, I'm, I'm glad that everyone is, is okay with the idea of a delay. Um, I would advocate that it be less than a year, um, just because um, I, I uh, you know, worry about, um, you know, what that a year is beyond, um, beyond next March, and you just never know who's going to be here. And, and because this is so detail oriented, um, it, uh, it, it might be a lot for a new crew to, uh, to catch up on. Um, but having said that, um, you know, um, whatever, whatever's the will of the group. So, um, in any case, I think, uh, any, any other comments that, uh, council would like to make? Okay. Um, Jay and then Dan. Well, I do think it's, you know, the year is somewhat arbitrary um, because because of the cycle of the housing market. So there might be an opportunity to, to look at it, but we, if we're going to do that and try to make it mandatory, you know, February 15th or something like that of 2022, then we, you know, I think, you know, we need to look to Bill and to staff and figure out, okay, how exactly, or to the committee and say, okay, we, we need to have a real structured feedback loop so that we can, um, and, and I do really appreciate the changes that have been made since, you know, since it being launched, I, you know, I feel like folks have been heard, but if we are going to move that up at all, then we need to, to um, acknowledge that the you know, we have a real structure around how the changes are going to made before going to be made before um, it's required. So I, but I, you know, that being said, I don't know that that's necessarily can be accomplished in that amount of time, given the cycle of the real estate market and and the number of transactions that happen in the summer versus the shoulder seasons. So. Sure, sure. Um, other thoughts. Uh, Dan, you have a comment, right? I was actually going to make the motion to amend uh, the ordinance. Um, the um, so let me make it, and maybe we can um, discuss it. it uh, I would move that we would amend the. Uh, and I'm looking at the amended ordinance in the packet, section 21-5, subsection B2, changing striking a thousand and inserting 500 for the penalty. And then I, I would also move, uh, move to amend section 21-7 um, striking January 1st, or striking January and inserting July 1st. Uh, I'd also move to strike um, uh, the July 1st, 2021 uh, effective date uh, and strike July 1st, 2021 and insert um, upon passage. That's my motion. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Um, any further discussion about these three changes to the language? You, Madam Mayor, will you take comment on the amendment? Um, yeah, give me one second though. Um, before um, before we jump in, any any um, thoughts from council? Uh, Lauren, go ahead. Sorry, was the, was the cap part of this one? Yes. Yeah. So just just wanted to make sure because I 
I missed it, um, or maybe it was part of the presentation. So just, I mean, I, I think I can live with it, just reiterating that the, the point of the city lawyer who had recommended a thousand because we want to be able to show that we would actually have the resources to defend it um, as a, you know, so that was like one and then that typical uh, caps and a lot of other state statutes are 800. So that would, was the next recommendation from our city lawyer um, to be more consistent uh, than 500. So just, again, I think I could live with either, but just that was the input we had received. Thank you. I, I did not mention that previously. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other thoughts on that part of it? Oh, okay. Uh, Stephen, go ahead. Uh, as you're amending this, I think I would ask you to consider the not misleading folks as to the amount of protections you're going to be able to give their data, uh, especially once it becomes mandatory. Uh, when it's optional, there may be personal privacy protection exemptions you can invoke, but once it becomes mandatory, you will lose those. And uh, I guess similar to the, uh, you haven't dealt with, uh, or your task force hasn't dealt with uh, uh, data creep of the homeless management information system, which is sucking up data on all of your uh, charges. Uh, this is one that that data migrates around on different systems and with false assurances of protections. And for, for this is an area that warrants uh, rock solid methodology and storage, you're going to have to insist on the security protocols anywhere the data is stored or transferred. Uh, what happens if you change software vendors or algorithms? Can you get the data out and move, migrate it somewhere else? Uh, this is way more complex than y'all are trading it. And uh, I just think that you should amend it to uh, make room for this type of analysis. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Peter, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think the motion that's been made is, uh, is a real step forward. Um, I, I do want to uh, underscore uh, what, something that Jay said and that Lauren said, um, and I think it's behind Dan's saying effective immediately. Really, I, I cheated a little bit by telling the story about my, my ride in the beginning, but I'm serious. This will require an affirmative effort to reach out to the people who might be selling their homes, et cetera, pulling them in, getting them to do it voluntarily, walking them through the process, see the challenges they meet. I, I could give you one or two just right now, but, but that is gonna be critical. Whether it's six months or nine months or 12 months, is less critical than what happens during those months. And I think you might want to talk to the real estate people about, you know, what makes sense. I mean, and of course they might not know now because of the COVID has made the real estate market go crazy, but leave yourself the opening to shorten or lengthen it by vote. If it turns out that you're getting tons of great information and the changes are happening, you've got great confidence, it might be shorter. But I, I think what happens over the next, whatever this period is, is going to be critical and really put together an advisory group like the one that, that we have with, with my ride, where you have all the, st the stakeholders really speaking up and looking at a lot of those little details. I'm just going to give you two quick details. Our home that we bought has um, vermiculite insulation. I had a home, uh, um, uh, uh, inventory done by WARM. And he said, no matter what else you do in the ha in this house, you got to put more insulation in your attic. But now I find out that if I have vermiculite, I may have, it. it's assumed I have asbestos. Now I'm looking at a possibility of a $20,000 amount just to remove the old insulation. That's the kind of thing we're talking, when I'm talking about I think one of the things you might want to consider as a mitigation 
is build in some exceptions for people who can't, like, like Connor said, I might not be able to afford to do X, Y, or Z. That doesn't mean that I wouldn't like to. So I, I think we really, those are some of the kind of things you'll only find out when you actually reach out to people like some of the people I've talked to who are hysterical about what are they going to do and, and get them to tell you, I'm really worried about this because I can't afford to do this. What am I going to do? And Jack, it's, there is a penalty. If you can't afford to make these changes, you're going to get a low score compared to the people who can afford it. And then the people who have the big good, the good numbers are going to be much more able to get their price than the people who have the bad numbers, because the buyers are going to, as um, Peter, the real estate guy said, are going to use that as a weapon, just as they use inspections now. So these are some of the kinds of things that really need to be investigated. I have hypotheses that need to be tested. Warren has hypotheses that need to be tested, you know, but they need to be tested. And this is the time to test them. Thanks. Okay, other thoughts? There's a motion uh, to amend. Any other thoughts on these changes? Um, just, just, I'm going to say this out loud, um, as, as folks were talking, um, it occurred to me that something that might be helpful with this, I mean, we've listed all of the kinds of outreach that we're going to do, um, that, that NEEP's going to do, that, uh, the, uh, Department of Public Works is going to do, but it also occurs to me that, like, something that we could maybe work on offering is, uh, we could have, like, a, uh, I guess I would call it a clinic uh, or like a class through the senior center. And so, you know, you don't have to be selling your home. Anybody who wants to do this um, could come and we can, we could have a day where we, um, uh, you know, help walk people through it and make sure that, um, that they're able to, to, um, to do it and um, have support of everybody um, as, as they're doing it. Anyway, just thinking out loud, that could be, that could be good. Um, anyway, just kind of a non sequitur. Um, other, uh, other, any other comments on these uh, these amendments? Uh, okay, so there's been a uh, motion and a second uh, to make these amendments. Uh, three amendments to uh, the language. Um, any further comments? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, and opposed. Okay, so the ordinance has been amended. Um, and so thoughts on passing it? Or any other further comments in general? Uh, Connor. Uh, I'll make the motion to pass the ordinance as amended. Uh, we got a motion and a second, Lauren seconding it. Um, further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, so that passes unanimously. Thank you again, everybody. Um, really appreciate uh, all of your thoughts, all of your comments. And uh, um, yeah, well, so, and we'll follow up with some updates as we go. Um, I think there's some, some good um, work for us to be uh, continuing to work on with this. Uh, Donna. Well, I do want to thank you for all the wonderful handouts. Uh, and But they do need to be updated. They ha have Jasmine as the contact for Montpelier. That, I don't think that's wrong. Unless, you do, is that your impression that it's wrong? We were intending to direct people to Jasmine. Okay, okay, good. Yeah, okay. she's, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, cool, thank you. I mean, we can continue to talk about that, that like who could or should be the contact to, but that's, that was our intent, so. No, they were very, very helpful. And that's something we should be getting out with our promotion. Great. All right, thank you. 
Um, all right, so we are going to move on. Um, so the, we switched the order here. So the Conservation Fund Award is next. And I think I saw some folks here from the Conservation Fund Board. I'm not sure that I still see them, though. Here I am. Ooh, yes, you are here, Paige. Great. Uh, Paige, you want to you want to take this away? Um, sure. I uh, we have reconstituted the Conservation Fund and the board. Um, thanks for your approval. Um, we have a really thoughtful board and we had several meetings over this award. Um, but we thought it would be really important to show support for the city from the city for um, for this purchase. Is it, everybody's familiar with the, the land purchase, right? The, um, okay. Um, we thought it was important to show support and, and there are many good reasons for going ahead with this purchase, I think. Um, it supports Act 171. There's some uh, unique habitats up there that were found on the, um, uh, the inventory that Brett Engstrom did in 2007. Um, the neighborhood really supports it because they there are trails through the properties that people use to access the park. Some of those trails go through places they shouldn't go through like wetlands and uh, the parks would be able to uh, correct those issues and, and close those trails and maintain the other trails better to prevent erosion, et cetera, et cetera. It's great habitat. It uh, connects to some of the important um, state priority level forest blocks that the state is interested in preserving. Uh, most of them are in Middlesex, but this is a good connectivity um, path. So there are, I think there are a lot of good reasons for doing this, um, for supporting this purchase. And um, the board had some thoughtful discussions about it, uh, about uh, the fact that there aren't parks in other areas of the city which we all agree with, but the fact is this was an opportunity and there haven't been opportunities in those other areas of the city yet. So when those are, uh, when those opportunities come up, then hopefully we'll, we'll be in a position to jump on them. But in the meantime, this is the opportunity that presents itself and I hope you'll support it. And I see Alec. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, if anybody has any questions, feel free. Um, Alec, do you want to add anything? Um, I just want to add, and in case you didn't hear, but it is public, um, it's been made public this week by the U.S. Forest Service that we were awarded the grant from the um, Community Forest Program for $258,000. And our proposal was ranked number four in the country. So we did a good job. And this is a, um, just a, another, another way to chip away at those matching funds. And um, $20,000 is a significant, significant contribution for sure. That's great. Okay. Any questions for either Paige or Alec? Donna. <laughs> I'm ready to make a motion that we approve the purchase. There, the, uh, oh, there's a second. Motion in a second. That's yeah, Jay. Technically, the motion isn't for the purchase. It's for right. awarding the $20,000 from the Conservation Fund. Right. So <laughs> awarding the grant. Thank you. <laughs> John Odom, you got that? <laughs> okay. So and uh and, and Jay, you're okay with that? Of course. Okay. Um and John's okay with that. Great. Okay. Uh any further discussion on this? Okay. Oh, Lauren. I, I was just gonna say that's really exciting that grant came through from the Forest Service. Congrats and great work team. I mean, number four in the country. That's really impressive work. So very excited and appreciative for all the work that went into that. And thanks, Paige, for the uh, 
putting putting this before us tonight. Glad to. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. Um, so there's been a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. And opposed. Okay, so the motion carries. Um, thank you, Paige and Alec. This is very exciting. So, thank you. Um, thank you very so much. <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you. Uh, all right, so now on to the Water Resource Recovery Facility Phase 2 project discussion. And I think I saw some um, members of uh the public works uh so should i just turn it right over to them bill did you want to say anything we'll first just, we'll just jump in here quickly and then turn it over to kurt and dpw um you know we embarked a couple of years ago on our waste water resource recovery facility project phase one which has been uh nearly nearing completion it's won a national award it's been you know very successful um for, from a technical standpoint and a financial standpoint as we had hoped and one of the uh, goals that the city had was to move forward to phase two, which would uh, re result in energy production. And uh, we had initially had high hopes when we, especially when we got the, the grant, $5 million grant that, that we would be able to do so with the initial um, bonding authority. But as you know, costs have risen and as we have new information, uh, it's gonna be a little tighter. So I think what we're gonna do today is Kurt is going to walk you through where we're at and what some of the challenges are and what some of the options may be so that you are fully briefed and you can perhaps provide some guidance to the to us as to if you have any preferences or if you want to proceed along with evaluating all the alternatives so with that i'm going to turn it over to kurt he does have a presentation i'm sorry i know it's late and you've been through a a big tough issue but this is also pretty uh important to i think our energy future and um in our infrastructure future so uh, there we go. Kurt, please. Okay, thanks, Val. Um, so I'm Kurt Modica, Deputy Director of Public Works and City Engineer. Uh, tonight joining me is Larry Doyle, who is the Senior Business Development Manager for Energy Systems Group. It's our partner on the Phase 1 project at the plant. And um, Chris Cox is here as well, who's our Chief Operator of the facility. Uh, they're primarily here to answer questions that might pop up that I may not be able to address. Um, that I will share my screen if I can. Oh, I need uh, some permissions to be able to share my presentation. Yep, and I just got named. Uh, hold on, I'm now the. Um, so, Bill, go down to the oh, bottom where it has security. Got it. And then you can check next to it, share screen. I got it. Awesome. Just figured it out, I think. Should be able to do that now. Okay. Uh, folks able to see this? See oh, the presentation? Yeah. No? Oh. Okay. I'll try it again. Nope, I'm still not able to get in, Bill. Yeah, I just did it again, too. Um, hmm. Cameron, you're killing me here. <laughs> well. There should be a check next to allow people to share screen. There is a check next to share screen. There, there you go. go. Oh, there it is. All right. Yeah, Thanks. just make it a full screen. Beautiful. Okay. Um, so thanks, everybody. Um, <clears throat> we'll just uh, start out by saying, you know, uh, this is a joint effort with ESG and the City of Montpelier Public Works. Um, ESG really compiled the first 13 slides of the presentation and then uh, DPW's um, generated the last five. So uh, the things we're going to cover tonight, what's been completed to date on the phase two effort, which is uh, combined heat and power. So that's um, uh, generating electricity from the methane and also getting heat recovery off the engine of the, uh, of the generator. Um, we will cover the objectives of the phase two project and what the scope was sustainability, net zero outcomes, the financial outcomes, and then um, one alternative that DPW has recently looked at that uh, we wanted to share with you, which is the solids drying. Uh, so 
The work we did under the project development agreement with ESG includes the standard offer program award for a, a power sale agreement that was awarded in December of 2020. And uh, through that, there's a 20 year term. The rate that the city was offered through the food waste set aside is um, 20.7 cents per kilowatt hour. And under that agreement, there's a completion date required of December of 2023. Additionally, we completed the um, inter interconnection agreement application process. That's with our local utility agreement and power. Uh, so that agreement is all set up, has not been executed, but um, it's, uh, it's uh, all drafted by Green Mountain Power with what improvements would be needed to the grid in order to support the sale of uh, CHP. And then the state permits required uh, for CHP was the air pollution, um, air pollution control permit. Uh, and which covers the entire facility and also which is uh, the larger more challenging one was the certificate of public good. Uh, ESG also completed design drawings and um, basis of design report uh, uh, secured pricing from subcontractors major equipment pricing and uh, and design. <clears throat> so we just recently uh, received a contract amendment if the, if the Council ends up going with a CHP project. Uh, received that um, at the end of April. There was um, a 60 day uh, response time uh, noted in the project development agreement. Uh, we've since talked to ESG and I think they're willing to be flexible on that. So that June 29th is not a hard date. It's just uh, really kind of a target we're, we're looking at as an initial um, path forward for um, how to utilize the methane. So the scope of work includes a 400 kilowatt generator uh, we have to treat the gas, clean it, uh, in order to run it through the generator equipment. There's heat conversion, which is the recovery of the heat off the engine to put back into the heating loop at the plant. And then the electrical transmission upgrades um, related to uh, Green Mountain Power's work. And just uh, just rehash kind of the phase one project that really set us up for utilizing the methane at the plant. Um, this the high strength waste that the city's uh, currently taking in we're still ramping up that waste stream um, but we do anticipate 21,000 million BTUs of gas annually uh, and that would allow the the plant to generate twice um, nearly twice what the power it uses from the grid currently and we're just about wrapping up that phase one project anticipated uh, the end of this month. There's really just a few punch list items, final paving and a few other items that need to be uh, addressed. Um, so the phase one project essentially rebuilt the entire plant except for uh, two, uh, two equipment, pieces of equipment. One is the screw pumps, which you just um, approved on the consent agenda. That's coming out of our operating budget. It's about $100,000. Uh, it's really just the bearings on those those large pumps that bring uh, the water, the wastewater, up to secondary treatment. Uh, the bigger the bigger project that still remains is the secondary clarifiers, and that one is going to be uh, we're, we've got preliminary quotes of $1.1 million for that. So I just wanted to highlight that's um, you know treatment of uh, the wastewater coming into the plant is you know top priority in that that equipment will need to be upgraded in the relatively near future so I have to keep that in mind as we look at um, financial impacts from these options uh, and so the great one of the great things about phase one and there's a lot of them um, there are some pictures that we'll be posting on the website this picture is uh, on the screen is uh, one that was just taken last week uh, you can see the new methane dome on, on the largest digester and really kind of an overall view of the facility as it's been upgraded. Um, but also we did all this work with really essentially uh, no uh, financial impact beyond what was budgeted within the master plan. So because of the grant money we got, because of the new revenue stream from high strength waste and energy savings, all of this work was done with essentially no impact, which is, um, which is really great for for the sewer ratepayers. And then of course, uh, as uh, we recently let council know, this project was awarded the Public Works Project of the Year um, under the environmental category, uh, so for small communities. So we're really excited about that. There's really gonna be an award ceremony, uh, I believe at the end of August in St. Louis. 
Uh, this is a graphical of the methane gas production at the plant. So the, the blue line is uh, what will be utilized. Well, actually, I'll start with the red line. The red lines are total uh, projected um, gas production, methane production at the plant. Uh, the green line is a combination of phase one and phase two utilizing the gas. So that's the generator and um, the heat loop at the plant being used. The blue line is just what is used under phase one. So the combined usage uh, would result in only about 15% of methane being flared at the plant. And some of the environmental benefits of the project, uh, we're looking really estimating 2.8 million kilowatt hours per year of electricity, which is uh, CO2 equivalent of 22,000 tons reduction. Um, greenhouse gases from 41, 441 passenger vehicles or emissions from 4,600 barrels of oil. Uh, so this is just kind of all different comparisons of, of uh, the environmental benefits to producing renewable energy as opposed to um, fossil fuels. Um, and then the carbon sequestered of 32,000 tree seedlings grown over 10 years of 2,400 acres of forest. And then the beat, the um, Heating benefits, a lot of this is really captured in, in phase one. Uh, we're already us, utilizing uh, some of the methane, as I showed you in that graphical, that graphic um, <clears throat> that equates to 145,000 gallons of, uh, of oil per year. Uh, that's not actual savings to the city, but that's uh, the equivalent of what the methane, if it was all used for heating reduction, would, be, would show. Um, so the uh, the food way the um, power sale agreement the city was awarded is um, was related to Act 148, which is really diverting waste from landfills, and there is a requirement under that uh, power sale agreement that 50% of the waste stream going to the digesters has to be categorized as food waste. Uh, Greece, unfortunately, in Vermont, is not does not fall under that category, um, but it does sort of change. Um, how we set up our contracts with haulers because we have to hit that threshold in order to comply with that agreement. And there will be uh, annual inspections according to our agreement with VEPI uh, where they will kind of verify that that's occurring. Um, so that would represent 38,000 tons diverted from the landfill. And then on the graphic, um, you can see the yellow line is what the plant currently uses for power. And then the green bar on the left is uh, what is um, what would be produced under phase two. And then the energy is the, the far right column, the heating energy. Uh, so just a little bit on some financial projections. So there's two ways to look at uh, how the finance, what the financial impacts will be under this project. Um, one is what the projected cash flow will be, and that is 90% um, of the digesters being filled with food waste. And then the other way is the other method, or um, it's really related to the project development agreement contract that we have with ESG is the guaranteed cash flow. So that's, um, that's the threshold under which if, if we don't meet that, there would be uh, ESG would be responsible essentially for covering the gap between uh, the guarantee, guaranteed cash flow versus what the actual was if it came in under. Uh, ESG feels there's a, a high likelihood that we'd be able to hit the 90%, but again, that's not a, a guarantee for the city. Um, so under phase one, we ended up with about $11.9 million of debt. Um, not all debt because, well, that is our, our current borrowed amount but we have offsets with revenue. Uh, so we're not actually making payments on that amount. We got a really low uh, interest rate from USDA, 1.5%. Um, and then under phase two, we're looking at uh, somewhere between a 5.7 to a $6 million project cost um, with a little bit higher interest rate, assuming we go through the uh, municipal bond bank. And then it includes annual loan M costs, which is made up of generator maintenance. So we'd have, um, a contractor come in and do the major generator work, you know, adjusting valves and changing spark plugs, and then the city would just be responsible for oil changes. And then there's a 
you know, there is some electrical load from the, uh, the heat loop and the pumps associated with recapturing that, uh, that hot water off the engine. There's uh, gas scrubbing equipment maintenance costs. So you have to change out the media um, at regular intervals. I think it's about three years. And then there's air testing requirements. So as part of the air permit, um, we would have to you know, verify the emissions levels that would be coming from the plant. Um, just want to make a, a quick caveat that uh, that this this summary is, a, is slightly different from the charts that are going to follow, only because um, you know ESG had made some assumptions that were just a little bit uh, varied from these numbers. And there's also a, a category called deferred maintenance, which is basically doing the aging infrastructure pieces of the project um, earlier than what we had projected in the sewer master plan. And so that's a, a, a savings from escalating costs. Um, but through my discussions with finance, we also have to account for depreciation. So that bar that you'll see on these charts uh, and, and in the tables is, is somewhat, is really offset from an actual um, balance sheet perspective. So I can explain that as we look at those. Uh, so that green bar deferred maintenance is what I was just referring to. So, you know, I think in viewing these, we probably could omit that amount. Um, but as you can see here, this is projected cash flow. So this again is the 90% fill on the digesters. It's, it is a, a cash positive, And this is um, looking at the project with combined phase one and phase two uh, revenue and savings. So if you look at the total project, both what we are just about to complete and if we added CHP onto it, this is kind of representation of uh, where we'd be financially. And then this is that a similar table or that graphical put into a table. Um, <clears throat> again, this is 90% filling the digesters at 90%. Um, you can see on the net benefit of phase two economics, um, there is a, a positive cash flow over a 20 year life of the generator. We'll, we would be looking at roughly a $630,000 cash positive project again at 90% at um, fill on the digesters. So now this is looking at what the guarantee levels would be um, through ESG. So the, you know, this is kind of worst case scenario. Again, uh, the deferred maintenance bar really sh probably shouldn't be represented here because of depreciation impacts. Um, so this again is also a combined project of phase one and phase two. So um, it is, you know, looking at this, I think it's it's slightly, you know, if you take the green bar out, it's slightly positive. Um, of that last number I was just referring to. Uh, this this table is showing um, a combined project again, phase one and phase two, um, and revenue of a total project, combined project of about $2 million over the 20 year uh, service life of the generator. Um, again, if you take that 330,000 annually from deferred, uh, deferred maintenance savings, um, it does come out a little bit negative. You know, I think it would be, if you summed it up for the full 20 years, it'd be close to a $4 million uh, negative uh, financial impact. With a lot of numbers, but um, I'll kind of get to the end. We're uh, coming here at the end. So this this graph or this table rather um, shows a breakout of phase one and phase two. So you can really look at them separately. And this is at, uh, again, guarantee levels. So this is worst case scenario. Um, and really the focus is on the net benefit. And this is why uh, DPW has some concerns with moving forward with CHP and that um, over a 20 year life, if you look at phase two CHP project as a standalone project um, at guarantee levels of waste streams coming to the plant, we would net a negative 3.6 million. Um, so this is really uh, why DPW has um, started looking into other alternatives for utilizing the methane. Um, this is not to say that this is how the financials would turn out, 
but we don't have any surety or guarantee that uh, they would be better than this either. So it's, it's just something that I wanted to uh, point out to council. Uh, and then I'll, <clears throat> just a quick summary of, um, you know, after we've completed this, uh, this project development agreement with ESG, just kind of want to summarize, highlight some of the, um, the accomplishments and some of the challenges we're facing. We signed this agreement in March of 2020, so it's been just about a year. Um, like I said in the beginning, we, we did uh, receive the standard office, uh, standard offer power purchase agreement for, the, for a really a high um, rate on the kilowatt hours exported from the plant. That's from the Public Utility Commission administered by VEPI. Uh, the project's fully permitted, so we have all our permits, including the Certificate of Public Good, which is a fair effort, and it is a shovel-ready project. So we could, uh, absent financing, um, you know, we are ready to start this project. Um, and the financial impacts we are looking at right now, a $5.7 million project cost. Uh, it could, you know, if, because we have to do a bond vote, there's gonna be some time delays regardless of when that bond vote occurs. So, uh, you know, I think it's likely there'd be some escalation uh, in construction material costs. So that number, you know, I think we're looking at more like a $6 million number likely before uh, the project would actually, or the uh, contract would be signed if council moves forward. And just to kind of touch on some of the uh, cost increases related to the project, um, there is a slightly different um, cost related from the conceptual design is what uh, ESG provided, based their numbers on back in March of 2020. And now we have final design, so it's a lot more detail. So that was part of the cost. Also the interconnection fees from Green Mountain Power, the infrastructure they need to install in order to support this um, uh, power export is more than what we anticipated by a little over hundred thousand um, dollars. So last time I came and presented to council, we talked about uh, negotiating with ESG to see if we could reduce the project cost and fund maybe the difference with operating revenue in the sewer fund. Um, we were able to negotiate a $300,000 reduction roughly, but uh, because the gap is so big, we cannot, uh, we, we cannot cover the, the difference um, with operating funds. Um, so that means we have to do a bond vote. Uh, and rough, right now, just for assuming we use all of the remaining bond capacity from phase one, we'd be looking at a one point, roughly a $1.5 million gap. Um, but again, just point out that the secondary clarifiers also need to be uh, completed roughly in this time frame. So I think you could add another, you know, at least 1.1 million onto that. Um, so in the project development agreement with ESG, they essentially performed this analysis, this work at risk, um, and under the um, you know sort of the outs for the city, if the guaranteed levels uh, do not cover the cost of the project, you know the city has the option um, to not move forward with it and is not responsible for the cost of ESG that they've invested in this project. Um, that's our interpretation of it, at least right now. We haven't really uh, discussed in detail with ESG, um, but uh, that's, and I have discussed briefly with our attorney, but um, we feel uh, because the guarantee levels don't cover the project costs that we're not responsible for the PDA fee. Um, the city's investment on this project is right now about $30,000. That's a lot of the permitting fees. We're not included in the ESG scope and we had some legal fees associated with development of the CPG. Um, as I noted, under guarantee levels, there's a potential to, for a negative uh, financial impact of 3.6 million over a 20 year period. And that's if you look at phase two as its own project, as a standalone project without factoring in the benefits from phase one. Um, if we hit projected levels, uh, then over the 20 year period, they estimating a $630,000 cash positive project. And then just one sort of um, intricacy related to these two projects, uh, because the, because the um, power sale agreement 
requires food waste stream, it changes how we um, structure our contracts with haulers because we really sort of have to reduce our price on food waste to incentivize them to bring um, that waste stream to the plant in order to meet the requirements of the power sale agreement. Uh, so there's a little bit of a, of a competing interest between the phase one and phase two because of that requirement. So that was a lot. I will stop there for just a, a minute and see if there's any questions related to that. So I, I have a few questions. Um, uh, so I want to make sure that I'm understanding this. I want to make sure that I'm really clear um, on this. So at the lowest guaranteed levels of revenue, is it uh, still a net positive for both projects? Well, if, if it depends on it, it depends on if you factor in that deferred maintenance cost or not. Right. Yeah. So because it looked like you know, in that one slide <clears throat> where the benefit was lower, um, it looked like if you took the deferred maintenance portion out, just based on the thickness of that that um, section, it looked like the benefit would be less than the cost. But I, I mean, I, don't I know. believe it is. Also, yeah. But Larry okay. can... I'll, I'll see. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> oh, thank you. No, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, so, so what that deferred maintenance number represents, so that's the aging infrastructure work that, that needed to be performed at the plant. So absent any of this organic energy project, that is just a real cost that would be realized by the city in its budget. So for the purposes of the cash flow as being presented, uh, as a savings, as a capital cost avoidance. So without this project, that's a cost that would be incurred anyway. So the net effect would be to, if you took it out of the savings, you also want to take out the, the $12 million roughly that that cost and just judge the project on the organic to energy components. Does that make sense? Yeah. So in I other words, yeah, you know, the organic to energy revenues I think through phase one was able to almost cover a lot of those costs that otherwise would have just been dead. So that it's, it's a balance. I think if you take it out, you also need to take out the capital associated with it to see the true value of the project. That makes sense. Or no. Right, it's like, yeah, so it's, it's like we would have to add in other costs um, for for that deferred maintenance somehow elsewhere. Yeah, you, you could treat it as those are costs that you would experience in any way, whether or not we were here. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I think that's that's helpful. Um, just, just quickly, if I may interject, just for uh, new council members, this is Larry Doyle from ESG Hello. here. <laughs> not everybody knows Larry. It's been a couple of years since you've... Yes. I've been able to come up for a year, so. Uh, Lauren, go ahead. COVID. Yeah, thanks. I guess I was just wondering, what are the major drivers? You showed us kind of best case and worst case scenario. Like what would be the, the difference? What would be changing, you know, whether or not we're hitting um, closer to 90% okay. or more? Um, you know, sure, no, good question. Um, I'll try to make it a short answer. Uh, the 90% represents, we, we model the project based on, you know, our expectation of can we fill these digesters, which we do fully expect to be able to do. I mean, right now we started our performance period, I think doesn't start for another six months, but we're starting to ramp up. And I think under contract at this time, we already have approximately 60% of the capacity filled with two to three year contracts right now. And there is a good supply of additional. So our expectation is within six months that we'll be filling the digesters. Now the guarantee level represents, well, take a step back. Kurt talked about the interactions. One of the things that, you know, that's important to consider is that the food waste is the fuel for the, for the generator and why they're interconnected. And 
and while we're treating them together is as we have been de developing the project, what we found is in the market, the tipping fee for food waste has market has gone down from what we initially anticipated. Whereas some of the tipping fees for, for brown grease, fog, and other items still remains high. So what happened is it would work against each other where on phase one, we, we would wanna overdrive and just bring in revenue. We could focus our waste efforts on less on food waste. Food waste has a, a cost to treat. It has more solids in it that has to get landfilled, um, you know, or uh, other uh, treatment costs, chemical costs. Uh, grease has a good energy component, low cost to treat. So the difference is what we looked at is, for, if you think about it, for each gallon of waste, when you have phase one and phase two has a financial value of a tip fee plus an energy fee. So there's energy revenue now. So although the food waste has a lower tip fee, it is worth the 20 cents a kilowatt hour from energy. So it was hard to treat both of these separately. So we combine those. And what we did was we, we looked at the project and with the guarantee, our proposal was that we needed to guarantee the cost to the city, which was the, the city's debt service plus the annual operation and maintenance cost. And from that, we derived that we would need to fill 60% capacity of the digesters. And that would equal roughly $100,000 more than what the city's costs were from the combined project. So if you, so one way to think about it is, uh, you know, phase one might throw off $500,000 a year of positive cash flow, And with phase two at the guarantee level, that lowers that from, from, from 400 to 100. I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but at the guarantee levels, it brings the positives down from 400 to 100. At the projected levels, which we feel is reasonable to project, it's going to maintain roughly at that same cash flow level. Hope I'm not confusing it. So, yeah, yeah. So phase two, in a sense, is hitting a policy objective. We think that the the waste we, we use the term projected because we have you know high level of confidence. We wouldn't provide any guarantee if we weren't confident that we could roughly bring in twice that amount. It would just be too risky. So it's a view of our view of the market also. However, our gar the guarantee is a contractual mechanism that we're offering. I would consider that you could look at that as a floor. You know, it, so that would be the floor. Uh, the ceiling will be 100%. We're just showing confidence that 90%. You could pick an, other numbers too. You could split the difference 60 and 100. You could say 80 is a planning number. It's um, so it, it's, it gets arcane because a lot, a lot of these models, they, they get very intricate because there, there's eight different classifications of waste. And a lot of the data is based on actual sampling because we've been able to run, we've been running the receiving station and pretty much all the different types of waste we're planning on receiving, we run through there. We have analytics for each sample. Uh, we've monitored the, the methane content of the gas if you remember in phase one, one of the reasons for holding off on phase two was to get an idea of how much gas we were gonna produce to this process in terms of percent methane. And we are projecting at about 60 to 62%. We're finding now we're getting 65 to 66% methane content. And that's a reflection of the digesters working like they're supposed to. I mean, the new systems uh, yeah, I can't say enough because the 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 Kurt and and the uh, the treatment plant staff have had to, you know you, earlier talked about people adopting the change. Well, they'd have to, they had to adopt the change. A lot of new equipment, uh, new control systems, and uh, they've been great to work with. And uh, you know this project isn't even commissioned yet, and those digesters are are performing, and we're bringing more and more waste in there as it gets ramped up. I'm digressing a bit, but it's, so 90% is what we're comfortable, we think is the 60% is, is the floor. And without combining them, we'd be working against our guarantee because if, if, if they weren't combined, we would wanna bring in more high revenue uh, or high strength organic waste, but that would 
be a deficit to the energy production. So we're trying to combine things and hit triple bottom line, you know, it's policy, financials, and what's the right mix, and this is what we came up with. Sorry, that's way longer. That wasn't a short answer, but it's not a, not a short problem. Yes? Dan, go ahead. Yeah. Dan. So um, being a little bit math phobic, if I'm understanding it correctly, the 60% is... Hey, oh, hold on a second. Um, Larry, would you mind muting yourself and or possibly Kurt? Okay. All right. So let's, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Dan. Sure. Um, okay. So, so the sixty percent capacity is, is basically a floor that we're thinking that would be guaranteed um, that no no less than that uh, amount. And the expectation, perhaps not the ceiling, but the expectation is that ninety percent is much more realistic. Is that uh, I'm understanding that correctly? Yep. Yes, that's correct. Y yes, correct. So one of my other questions is what, what happens if there is no phase two? Well, that's the second half of the presentation. Okay. Well, I don't, <laughs> don't, don't spoil it for me. Right. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Oh, there's another half. Maybe we should uh, hold off and uh, hear your, your second half. Sure. I just wanted to sign up. Um, Take a break and talk about the CHP option before we moved on. Well, I do have that, one. Can... I do have one question about that, um, which is: uh, so I heard you say you know you're looking at other options because phase two alone is net negative, right? Uh, and I, so, sorry, go ahead. Well, at guaranteed levels, it's net negative. Right? At guaranteed, right? At guaranteed levels, it's net negative. Um, I, that, that causes a, a whole other string of questions for me. Like, uh, so that feels like going back, um, few steps, uh, in terms of what to do with that, uh, that methane, right. Uh, you know, looking for a new plan, which I think brings up questions for me about the timeline. And if there's this deadline that we have to be using or like the, the project has to be completed by, uh, was it 2023? Um, you know, it seems like there'd be some more pressure. Like, does the rest of the deal fall apart somehow if we don't get it done by 2023? Um, does, yeah, that, so, does that make sense? Right. So, um, so the deadline is through our uh, power sale agreement and that deadline, like I said, is December of 2023. That's when we have to have the system up and commissioned or we lose that 20.7 kilowatt hour sale, our power sale rate. Um, we have to, if we do CHP, we're gonna have to do a bond vote. And uh, I think if we did a March bond vote, so we don't have to have a special election, um, the project timeline uh, from what I hear from USG is 13 months. So if we had a bond vote in March, warned it, uh, at the end of this year, um, we're still on track to hit those deadlines. So I think, you know, what DPW is, going, is proposing is to evaluate one other alternative between now and the end of the year, uh, and then decide what's the bath, best path forward for the city. And that would still give us time to put something on the, if we wanted to still put something on the March ballot, we still could. Right. The end of this year, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, any other questions about the combined heat and power part? Okay. All right. Go ahead, Kurt. All right. Okay. So, um, like I said, uh, you know, we, anticipated uh, under the CHP option that we would have a guaranteed revenue that matched the cost of the project. Um, it just didn't pan out that way. So uh, just in the last two weeks, so this is very high level, um, but just in the past two weeks, DPW has just looked at, wanted to look at uh, what is the other option for utilizing methane at the plant. I mean, it is an asset, an asset that was created 
uh, through the phase one project uh, and we want to utilize it um, but we want to utilize it in, in the best way possible for the city of Montpelier and the sewer rate payers. Sorry to interrupt, um, Kurt. Could yeah, you sure. make that bigger? Like oh, sorry. Screen? Yep. Yeah, no worries. There you go. Great, thank you. <clears throat> um, so what we're looking at is a, a waste type um, low temperature uh, dehumidification system, which is really um, a way to uh, improve the solids content of um, you know, the biosolids from the plant. So every time we take in, whether it's septage from residential tanks or high strength waste now, or even you know, the waste that comes down the pipes from Montpelier residents, um, all of those things result in a solids uh, component. And those solids currently are all um, brought up to the landfill in Coventry. Um, so what we're looking at is, uh, is two units, two of these dehumidification type units, which uh, are able to dry out these solids, um, the capacity of 110 gallons per hour. So we'd, if, if we had two of these, we'd have redundancy uh, where each of them could handle what we're estimating for um, demand on the system to dry all of the solids from the plant. And what uh, some of the other equipment would be required would be a hot water line uh, from the new boilers, um, to run through an exchanger to heat these units and dry out solids. And additionally, you need conveyors to you know, bring the solids from the new screw presses, which um, gets our solids down to 25%, um, I guess them to 25% solids. Um, we'd have to bring that, uh, convey those over to this new equipment. And then some way, once we do have a 90% dry, um, uh, uh, total solids uh, level, we need some way to store this, um, this material. Um, so some of the, the nice things about this system, it's a low temperature with about 165. There's no open flame like most traditional drying systems are, so you don't need a sprinkler in the building. It can get to a class A biosolid. There's an opportunity for order reduction because this is like an enclosed system as opposed to our open boxes that we dispose of in with now. Um, like I mentioned, you can go from 25% to 90% total solid, so that really reduces the disposal volume. And it can um, it can run in automation 24-7. Most of those, most other uh, drying units really, um, you have to have uh, staff present because of the fire hazard. Um, financial benefits associated with this, uh, we pay about $250,000 a year uh, to dispose of our solids at the landfill. Um, there is, um, we've been talking to one company a, uh, that's represented locally here. They offered to take the, um, the class A solids and they were, they gave us a budgetary estimate of about hundred thousand dollars a year uh, cost to manage those solids for us. They would no longer go to the landfill and be turned to beneficial use. Um, it allows us more flexibility in our leachate rates. Uh, right now, because all of our all of our solids go to the landfill, um, and their leachate comes to us, we've had price stability in our disposal costs. If we were no longer utilizing the landfill, um, you know that gives us the option to raise our rates on leachate. So there's just one cent on the leachate rate, and we haven't raised them uh, in many years. I, no, I don't think at least in the last ten years they've gone up because it would just cost us on the on the disposal side. Um, but just raising them one cent would result in an $80,000 a year annual revenue increase. There's also, um, there's also a potential for revenue from the sale of the Class A. Again, this company we've been speaking with, it's RMI. Um, they offer the profit sharing from the sale of, of this material. Um, and then like uh, uh, I spoke to earlier and Larry mentioned, you know, it just gives us that flexibility where we're not trying to um, you know, reduce our price on food waste in order to get that stream, uh, you know, focus on that waste stream in order to meet uh, the 50% digester feed requirements. Um, I've also spoken to some folks at DEC uh, and they've, they've indicated there's a very good likelihood that this project would be eligible for some grant funding. Um, we got a pollution control grant on phase one that grant program is very specific to solids handling, which uh, would this uh, dryer would qualify under. 
Um, and there's also uh, under the the loan program, there's um, there's funding, design subsidy money, which is essentially grant money uh, for design work. Um, we've really pushed and try to get at least some sense of what the equipment would cost. And for the two units that can each handle the total uh, solids uh, generated from the plant, uh, would they provided a cost of 1.6 million. So just want to note that's not total project cost. You know, there's a lot of other items, design costs, um, uh, and all the other equipment, the conveyors and things in the trailer that I mentioned. Um, so I don't know, we don't know yet, this needs further evaluation, what the total project cost would be, but I, you know, I think there is, um, there's, it's worth looking at this a closer because of one, the grant, you know, the grant um, opportunities, uh, but also, you know, just the, the major piece of equipment is, um, is at a fairly, you know, low number compared to, you know, some of the other options that were looked at. Early on, if you remember, um, ESG did a very high level analysis of, of other alternatives and CHP was, you know, by far the most attractive option. Um, but we're taking a little deeper dive into this and it's also a relatively new uh, style of dryer, uh, which, which has a lot of uh, benefits that the other ones don't. Um, so environmentally, uh, we'd be reducing our disposal volume from 3,600 wet tons to 960 wet tons. And we no, you know, no longer have the trucking all the way up to Coventry. Um, right now we're moving, I think, four boxes, four trailers uh, every week from the plant to Coventry. Um, again, this is a way to utilize the methane generated. And one of the attractive things about the dryer is that our peak need for solids drying is in the summertime. And that's you know, well offset from our heating needs in the winter. So it really has the opportunity to provide a good energy balance where you're getting uh, year-round utilization of as much methane as we can. Um, and then again, uh, you know, we do have a water resource recovery facility. Uh, this is one product that is not recovered. This, uh, you know, the solids from the plant, um, you know, a project like this would allow us to, re you know, recover that project and turn it into a, something beneficial um, to the to the community, you know, to the region. Um, by turning into a class A material. And, and lastly, you know, we spent a fair amount of time discussing uh, PFAS at the plant, um, you know, by taking away our reliance on the disposal costs or reliance on Coventry for disposable of our solids, um, you know, we have more flexibility to really evaluate uh, whether or not we take leachate uh, without as much of a financial impact. We, we do generate revenue from receiving leachate, but um, we wouldn't be sort of hit uh, double by increasing our disposal costs and losing the revenue from leachate if, um, if that's a path council wants to take in the future. Uh, so some of the facility benefits, you know, we're not locked into a 20 year contract. That's a really a long term commitment, um, that, which is a part of our power sale agreement. Um, you know, things change and uh, that kind of duration is, is a little bit concerning to us. Um, it also allows us to be better prepared for what the regulations may be on sludge management in the future. Uh, there are changes, you know, land application is getting more and more reduced, um, you know, and, and even landfills, I mean, we only have one landfill in the state. Uh, so, um, you know, it really kind of sets us up to manage all of our own waste ourselves rather than relying on outside entities. And then um, uh, because it's all enclosed, there's no air permit required. So it's just one less permit that we have to manage uh, at the plant. And as I mentioned, uh, this one company we've been talking to and, you know, we'd, we'd really want to evaluate um, all our options for this style or type of dryer. Um, but they, it's uh, Resource Management Incorporated. They're affiliated with uh, Shinsei USA. Um, they are currently piloting three dryers, one in Brattleboro, Bells Falls, and hooks at New Hampshire. Our staff are uh, Chris uh, Cox and Matt Linson, who's our Assistant Chief Operator. Uh, they went down and visited one of these facilities yesterday, um, and you know they they were impressed by the equipment. Um, but there's not any, you know, just one. 
um, caution is that there's not any currently uh, fully operational in the region. Um, like I said, it's a relatively new technology. It, it needs to be evaluated, um, but it does look promising. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, this company, RMI, offers solids management services. So they will guarantee to take um, the Class A material that we'd produce, um, you know, and manage it for four feet. Uh, and um, <clears throat> what, how they manage it is by taking this material, taking the Class A biosolids, um, and turning it into a beneficial product, uh, you know, for agricultural type uh, benefits or municipal highway projects. They even fill mines, fill old abandoned mines with this type of material in other parts of the country. Uh, so our recommendation as a department is to look further into this uh, solids drying alternative. Um, you know, it's like I said, only we only had a couple of weeks because we were uh, still working under uh, the CHP project, you know, uh, negotiating costs with ESG. Um, but, at, you know, just at a high level look at this, we think that there is some potential here. Um, so we'd like to refine the project scope, you know, really dial in the total project cost, which we do not have yet, uh, verify the savings and the revenue associated with the project, look into the grant funding opportunities. I have not spoken with USDA yet. There's, there's a potential there. Um, look at the gas balance. So uh, ESG is, has indicated that if we do go this route, they are interested in partnering um, with the city and evaluating, uh, you know, the, the methane usage, which really we don't have the expertise to do in-house. So um, we would need uh, outside support. And then uh, the state has indicated that they are very interested in uh, uh, pilot testing equipment and they have even indicated they would cover the cost if there was one associated with piloting uh, different systems. So, you know, one of the many reasons phase one was successful is that we did pilot a lot of equipment uh, on dewatering. Um, and we really got to see all the different styles out there. And, and you know, I think I can speak for Kristen saying, uh, we feel like we ended up with the best possible option there. Um, so there's, you know, always, uh, it's always a benefit to try before you buy kind of thing. Um, and then as we noted earlier, uh, we have to have a bond vote. It, I don't think it compromises, or I know it does not compromise the construction schedule for CHP. If that does turn out the path council wants to move forward with, um, we have essentially till the end of the year to sort of make a decision of uh, which path is best to move forward with. So that is the end. Go over for questions. Um, thank you. That is, I, I think that's very interesting. And I guess I'll just start us off by saying, oh, um, if you wouldn't mind muting yourself, Kurt, sorry. <laughs> um, sorry, thank you. Um, uh, I think that second option is very interesting and looks worth looking into. Um, I have a lot of physics related questions. <laughs> maybe chemistry related questions like uh you know does uh does the process of drying break down huh, things like PFAS I assume the answer is no because it's low temperature um, um anyway and also so that means that things like PFAS would be would would be intact in the class A biosolid uh and if you're using it in agricultural purposes like is that is that problematic uh but all of that is sort of maybe not it's it's not exactly our well i was gonna say it's not exactly our problem but it's but you know it is something that i feel like is important to know um do you have any thoughts on on that if we're creating a class a biosolid that might have um things like pfas in it right so, so um it, it does, does not uh, the system system the animals 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 really wrong with your audio you no. yeah it's doing that's 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 yeah it's doing the super choppy thing you get tom waits going i was gonna call in you're gonna call in on your phone got you okay um perhaps while kurt is doing that other comments or questions on this um part of the presentation um lauren go ahead um 
Yeah, I was I was also going to ask about that. I know that um, like Maine, for example, they've been doing a lot of testing of um, land application of biosolids and they're basically finding PFAS in every sample. I was just pulling up a study. It's like 93% with PFOS, 65% with PFOA. Like it's really high and they're finding it in farms and they're finding it in milk and they're finding it like I my if I like was going to bet on it, I think we're going to have regulations around not allowing land application of PFAS containing sludge sometime in the next few years. So I would just want to be really thoughtful about if we were investing in something that was then going to become a problem for us to figure out how to handle because we're um, down the road. I mean, I think it, it does seem really interesting. And if that issue could be dealt with somehow, it's, um, I mean, there's probably there might be other contaminant issues too. I just had seen some studies on the PFAS in particular, because I know it's been a big issue in Maine. Um, so I definitely would want to understand that and what like RMI and others are doing about it, because I assume it's a problem everywhere that they're operating. So maybe they have some solutions or, or alternatives that they're looking at to deal with that. Um, just a couple other like questions. I would definitely be interested um, and like learning and maybe it's part of a MEAC or our net zero, like what are the pros and cons from our meeting our net zero goal of the two alternatives that we're looking at? It would be good to know what um, what that looks like. Um, was also curious or just noting, you know, I mean, there's, there's gonna be really unprecedented water infrastructure money that the state already through the American Rescue Plan Act is setting aside. It's you know still in negotiation, but it's like a hundred million dollars and we've got some really great local <laughs> allies in the legislature. So this kind of project, I you know, maybe maybe either of these projects could be interesting, um, but seeing maybe trying to get a sense of if there's opportunity there. Um, you know, one of the few things that was called out in ARPA was water and sewer infrastructure. So there might be money that's not normally available. Um, so just would want to make sure that we're obviously exploring all of those possibilities. Um, and just one other conversation that's been happening at the state house, um, like the standard offer program, I, they, there's talk of it going away in the next couple of years or trying to get a two year extension. I just, I don't know um, for, it certainly would be an open question in my mind if we like punted on it, if we could get that ever again in the future. So I think it, it would either be like act under that now or at least be a very open question if that specific program an opportunity and maybe they would replace it with something else, but um, this might be kind of the shot. So if we could figure out, you know, if we decided we wanted to move forward with that, it, it might be like have to get it done in that 2023 timeline. And I don't know, it would be worth maybe finding out if they would like grandfather in projects that they or something if there was some extension or some opportunity to reapply but I just know that that's that program seems to be kind of on its last legs so just noting that thanks um Kurt did you want to respond to are, are you in the meeting yet Kurt on your phone nope oh may maybe I do see a number um, but I also saw, Larry, you had your hand up. Do you want to respond to any of that? Yes. Uh, no, just to the PFAS issue. So, you know, first it's ubiquitous. It's, 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 it's regional problems. I think the government, you know, the regulators understand that each individual community or municipality can't expend the capital to put in treatment systems and it's high temperature thermal, right? It's the, uh, not incineration. Actually, Massachusetts, they have incinerators. Those are places where they're, they're trying to get rid of them, but they're actually, you know, it's a dichotomy of being able to destroy PFAS, but um, emit CO2. So I think those things are going to be handled regionally. With thermal drying, the, the basic benefit you get is you have a lot less of what you're having to deal with. You're, you're just evaporating water. So, so right now, you're, you know, the, the material is, is 75 percent water is what's getting trucked and landfilled. So the, just the premise of thermal drying is just evaporating that water. Uh, so you, you have less of a material to worry about disposition. And what we're seeing in Massachusetts and other areas are starting to see utilities or municipalities start to discuss together regionalization. 
you know, share the, the high capital cost of, and biosolids management, you know, Kirk brought it up. It's not just savings today. I mean, this is future risk management. So it's a big unknown. And we're seeing utilities or municipalities making the decision that they want to control their own destiny moving forward. And part of that is having a class A material always gives you more options on what to do and having less of it gives you a whole lot more options. So, so the value of having those options, having a higher quality material and less of it sets you up better for the future. Um, we have a project that we're doing thermal drying now, and it was driven because it was a customers in the Chesapeake Bay watershed and they were land applying a good class B material for years. And just last year, they lost uh, two or three of the five farms that they were utilizing because uh, things are getting more stringent, stringent with Chesapeake Bay, but also PFAS concerns. And they made the decision, we're gonna move to do a class, a, a dry, or reduce our volume and go to a class A and they're making it a regional. So they're gonna bring in other municipalities. So short answer is yes, it's a problem. It's all over. It, it can't paralyze decision-making, but when you have a better quality material and less of it, it always sets you up better and gives you options. That's all. Yeah, I, I also appreciate the possibility of being less dependent on the leachate. Um, that, that's also interesting. Other, uh, or uh, Kurt just checking in. Oh, oh, I see, oh, multiple hands. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> Jeff and then Kate, go ahead. So neither one of these guys have uh, patted themselves on the back enough and you haven't patted yourselves enough on the back enough for the success of phase one. And I, I, I just, I, I need everyone to focus on what's happened here, which is a huge, huge win for the city and success for ESG and the partnership that that was forged two, two years ago and is now almost completed. It's pretty incredible when you look at the numbers. And I, 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 before we begin to deal with the problem of what to do with all the gas that we're gonna be producing, we need to understand that we made a really, really great decision and you guys were the drivers for it and ESG was the amazing, uh, you know, environmental contractor that helped the Kurt and Chris m make it happen. I mean, if you look at the photos, it's pretty amazing what we did. So I just want to pat everyone on the back for that because it's, it's truly uh, a remarkable achievement. So then we turn to what are we going to do with this gas and I mean, it's, it's really, uh, this is a, another win-win situation that we have here. So we have to figure out whether it's more cost effective to do this dryer than it is to do the CHP. That's really, because there's so many environmental benefits. I mean, Lauren, you, you brought up what are our net zero goals? I mean, we do have to think about the trucking that we have, the, the disposal costs that we have, CHP is really not going to help us get to the net zero because we're giving up the wrecks. So basically CHP is generating revenue that would allow us to buy wrecks. That y y from, a, from, a, from the net zero city's goals, we need to look at that from that perspective. If it comes out to 90% that Larry hopes for and ESG thinks, then there's going to be probably money available for purchasing wrecks. But that's what you're talking about. Um, you're still going to have those non-avoided costs of transportation and the 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 sludge uh, disposal costs. So, I mean, from and, and I'm, I'm a MEAC member. We haven't been able to have a committee me member. Uh, we haven't 
been able to meet as a committee since all of this new information's come out. So I'm speaking personally is basically what I'm saying. I'm not speaking for the committee. Um, but it only makes sense to me that we need to explore this drier option. We just need to explore it. I love the fact, Larry, I got to say, I love the fact that you guys are on board to also explore it more um, and, and work with us on it because you've been an amazing partner. Um, so I, I've talked too much. That's, that's what I've got to say. I think we need to explore it and we need to come up with the best option moving forward on using the gas. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Kate. So Kate Stevenson, Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee. Um, so I, I echo a lot of what Jeff said um, in just the, how great this project has been and, and, and how much we value the partnership with ESG. Um, you know, one of my questions, Kurt, is, is you said that, you know, you obviously need to work with um, ESG as an outside consultant to, to look at the, the methane utilization, but I'm curious if you have any sort of back of the napkin numbers yet on what you think the percentage utilization would be. Because um, one of my concerns all along is just, you know, how much are we talking about flaring of the gas? And it just feels like a, a waste. Um, so, I, but I don't know yet what the, the thought is in terms of how many BTUs it takes per gallon to um, to dry it. So, I'm I'm curious about that, and and just want to also encourage us to remember that the that we are in the process of building the city's net zero 2030 plan for municipal operations, um, and we will be bringing a draft of that to the council in the next six weeks probably. We're we're shooting for the end of June. Um, and this is an important piece of it. The dollars are important, obviously, from an operating budget perspective um, and a funding perspective, but I also would just encourage us to look at the overall net zero goal, the carbon impacts of these different options. Um, you know, that wasn't really part of this presentation, but I hope as we, if we decide to take the next six months to dig into it further, that we're looking at the emissions impacts of these different choices. Um, and taking that into consideration as well. So that's it. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And Kurt, you know, uh, if you're in the meeting, you know how to, un uh, how to unmute yourself? Oh, yeah, looks like you yeah, got I'm it. I'm here now. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so a few things I would like to follow up on you know, while I was unavailable there. Uh, first, the PFAS uh, issue. Um, so right, this, this equipment, that we're looking at currently does not um, destroy PFAS, but there is a technology out there that does. Uh, it's paralysis. Um, and in order to uh, run the solids through the paralysis unit, you have to first um, you have to first dry it. So this would be a step towards that if the council you know wanted to um, you know make that a goal in the future it could potentially be regulatory i think it's probably a ways out uh, as far as requiring municipalities to do it um, but this is a step towards that process we actually did speak to one company um, that provides that type of system um, and you know they gave us some budgetary numbers on costs of, of both units the dryer and the um, paralysis unit and it was the equipment alone is roughly around five million um, but that system that they have uh, does not really utilize the methane. So that's why we um, decided to take a step back and look at the other option uh, as sort of the, the step one. So that's, that, that's kind of my comments on PFAS. Um, on the financial, you know, uh, Kate just mentioned, you know, um, the financial uh, impacts um, are not the only thing, and I agree, uh, absolutely. <clears throat> but I do want council to be aware of, um, the many needs within the sewer fund. Uh, you know, we have eight sewer pump stations. Most of them were built in the 60s. Um, they're getting scary, you know. They're 30 feet in the ground. Uh, they're probably at least a three quarters of a million each to replace those. Um, so there's some big, big dollar investments that need to occur uh, in our system. Uh, also, our pipes are almost all clay tile. You know, there's no gaskets in them, so 
the groundwater just runs in and that uh, contributes to our sewer overflows. Uh, and, you know, that is also a very big environmental concern. Um, we don't want, you know, we're, we've been working for a long time towards eliminating sewer overflows, you know, and any, any financial uh, impact that takes away from that is going to delay that, that goal and that environmental benefit by eliminating CSOs. Um, so I just wanted, you know, just to give you a kind of high level that there's a lot of needs out in the, in the sewer system. Um, and then Kate, you mentioned uh, methane use. So uh, ESG, again, uh, they did a very preliminary look at uh, methane utilization um, from these dryers we're looking at. Uh, they, they think there might actually not be enough gas but to possibly um, to operate these in winter months. But again, we, we really need to dive into the details. So, uh, you know, I think there's a good chance that uh, most, if not all the gas would be utilized, but um, I can't, we can't say that with certainty at this point. It's just a lot of work to do to figure that out. Um, I think that answers the questions that came up so far. So I'll turn it back over to other concerns. Any other thoughts, comments? Uh, I, I'll, I'll, so I see you, Dan. I also just want to add that uh, there is a part of me that loves the possibility that this is a step towards pyrolysis. I'm just gonna put that out there. Um, Dan, go ahead. Well, I, I, I guess um, my sense is that it's well worth exploring the second option for phase two, um, you know, in large part one of the things that I think is attractive is uh, what Jeff was saying uh, about the idea that the, these represent actual savings to the environment. Um, fewer truckloads, um, recycling actual material, as opposed to the rec credits that, um, you know, really are paper um, and aren't necessarily improving uh, our our footprint maybe maybe credits but um, I think it's I think it's a substantial it's worth exploring um, and I think it's ultimately worth comparing um, and it would be nice to have uh, you know sort of uh, once we have those costs and effectiveness fixed to sort of look at and compare the two uh, projects but I'm I'm certainly supportive of this drier option I. I I like what it, it actually does for the products that we are accepting and currently processing now and the potential impact that it would have on the immediate environment. So I just want to be conscious of the time here. Uh, if, if other folks have comments, I certainly want to um, let you, you know, chime in. I'm getting the sense that people are, uh, in terms of providing feedback and direction to, uh, to Department of Public Works, that uh, sounds like we should be exploring this, this other option. I don't think we need a vote um, necessarily. I'm seeing some thumbs up. Um, and it's, it also sounds like we're going to talk about this in the future. And I apologize, of course, talking about energy, I could just do endlessly which is dangerous. Um, so any other thoughts that folks want to share on, on this? Donna? Just, just great appreciation for all the information and how they presented it. Thank you, Kurt and Larry and Jeff, Kate. Thank you very much. You all make it make sense. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Yes, thank you. And I also want to thank uh, Jeff and Kate for sticking around. It is nearly 1030. You are awesome. Um, Can I just make one last comment? Um, yep. Okay, uh, so the next step, you know, if we're going to evaluate the dryer is, you know, to develop a contract uh, with ESG, um, maybe one of their engineers. So that'll be the next time you see something on that, hopefully relatively soon, uh, you know, we are going to have to spend, you know, spend some money to evaluate this. Uh, so I just wanted to put that out there that there will be a cost to looking into the dryer a little further because we don't have the expertise in house to do that. And just to be clear, that will be covered by 
out of operational budget or that'll come out of the existing bond or what do you think? It would have to come out of the wastewater budget. Okay. And that's, that's a hit you're prepared to absorb. I think we can manage it because the phase one project is doing so well. <laughs> okay. okay. Great. Okay. Um, do you need anything more from us? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm all set. Thank you. Okay. Larry, go ahead. Just to request a travel budget for Kurt because we're going to be presenting phase one at a lot of conferences. <laughs> and, uh, so you're ready. And, and, and other than that, you know, thank you, Council, Mayor, for you know taking the bold step and having faith in in the project and the idea because it's uh, we're really appreciative of it. You know, showing faith in us and it's it's it was as Jeff said, it was a, a really important decision and it really puts. A, I, I think this plant in, in its class is one of the top plants in the country now in terms of what it does, in terms of resource recovery, efficiency, and how they're managing biosolids. So just thank you on ESG's behalf. Really like working with you. That's, That's great. it. That's great. Very high praise. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, so unless folks have more things that they want to say, we're going to move on. Um, I do get the sense that we sh should not jettison topics, right? Even though it's late. Um, Jay, did I see a hand there? No, okay, just checking. Um, okay, so we're gonna keep uh, moving on then. Um, Please supervisors contract, Bill. Well, we, this was on the agenda last week and you asked us to look into um, one section of the one, you know, one sentence in, in the contract. As I mentioned, this is a supervisor's union is a new union. So we were creating a base contract for them to work from, which uh, was derived from the patrol officers, but altering some language to make sure it properly reflected supervisors versus patrol. Uh, and our agreement going into both it from both the union and city was that we would not make any substantive changes. So we did look at the, the sentence that was raised by a resident last week. And I think, you know, the conclusion I got talking to other folks and talking to union people and attorneys is that um, this was, you know, it's not giving the police or the union carte blanche to ignore any city um, ordinances. It talks about if there's an ordinance that's in direct conflict with the contract, uh, and we don't really have a lot of ordinances that deal with personnel issues other than you know the personnel plan, I think might be considered an ordinance, um, that the assumption would be the contract would prevail and that if if there were found to be a conflict, we would try to resolve, you know, resolve that. And the intention behind that isn't to allow people to ignore you know, to, to uh, not have to follow ordinances. It's actually to protect, to protect the collective bargaining process. You know, in theory, we could propose something at the bargaining table and, you know, not reach agreement on it. So settle a contract and then pass an ordinance imposing it. And that is completely out, you know, that is not what is supposed to be happening. So I think, you know, this clause of, and, and, and also, mind you, that clause, as I said, we haven't talked about it in the 26 years I've been here. So it's not like it's something new. It's, it's, it's there to protect the integrity of the process. I suggested language that talked about an ordinance pertaining to mandatory topics of collective bargaining. That would just clarify what those ordinances were. And I don't think there was disagreement, but the, basically the supervisors union said, hey, we agree we weren't gonna make any substantive changes we think this is a substantive change. We'll talk about it when we get to the table. And, you know, that same language is in the patrol officers union and it's in the fire officers union. So I intend to make that, propose that change with all of them. I think it keeps the same integrity of what's intended to mean and clarifies it. But my recommendation is that we get this one taken care of so because um, we have to start bargaining with them for the next one uh, very soon. So that's... Yep, uh, Jack, go ahead. Because the uh, proposal to approve the contract was 
laid on the table at our last meeting. I think the proper thing to do now is a motion to take it from the table, and I make that motion. I'll second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Any all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, so that is now up for discussion. Jack, go ahead. I move we approve the contract. Second. Okay, we got a motion and a second. I would say I, I agree, especially with the commitment from the city manager that he is going to uh, bring this amendment or you know, proposed change language when it is up for further uh, debate, which is very soon. Um, other comments? Okay, uh, Dan. Yeah, I'll just say I'm, I'm assured by the, the uh, fact that the attorneys um, who interpret these contracts on a regular basis have offered that same interpretation that it is of limited import. And so I think that's, uh, I feel comfortable voting for it with that uh, opinion as well. Okay, any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. All right, so that passes. Uh, we are on to the summer schedule. Um, I do actually suspect that if we wanted to, we still could jettison this one. Um, we do still have time to. You could, although um, the yeah. schedule that we put in there basically worked for just about everybody and it, it still would allow you to get rid of one meeting. So we could wait, we could wait another meeting, but I will say from our perspective, the sooner we know the schedule, the sooner we can line, tell people when to line up contracts and you know, so it's always earlier is better, but you know, certainly if there's going to be a debate about it, let's, let's put it off. If everyone's okay with the dates, then. Yeah, no, fair enough. The, these are fine with me. Other thoughts? We've got one thumbs up. Yes, Donna. I'm just a little disappointed that we don't lose one. That's all. You can. You can. <laughs> it's you summer. Can. A block of time. No, there's, <laughs> That's I, all. I just, Saying that those are the dates that work for everybody, but if you all want to drop one, pick one and drop it. Well, how about uh, I, I think that is a uh, something that we should discuss, but maybe we don't have to discuss that right now. So, um, you, so what you're going to do is you're going to move to accept the new schedule as the calendar, and then next meeting talk about which one to drop. I like that. Is like there that a motion? Much. Okay, Dan's making that motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay, we got multiple seconds. Uh, any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. And opposed? Okay, great. Um, righto. We can, uh, build this, we can do this in the, at the end. The executive session? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't um, have to be super long. Okay, um, so we'll do uh, council reports and um, then we'll likely have a executive session around um, collective bargaining. So it, it actually lists uh, the mayor's report first. So I'm gonna go first this time because that's <laughs> what it says. Um, so. I have just a couple things on my radar. One is that I had a constituent call uh, this week um, from a, a fellow who was interested in us going back into uh, regular public meetings in person, um, basically as soon as the governor allowed, which is May something. But uh, that is not what we had agreed on. Um, his understanding was that the the um, we could go back to in person as soon as as um, as soon as some some date in May, which we're in right now. Um, is that your understanding as well, Bill or Cameron? Uh, I think so. I'd want to double check that, but okay. um, I think um, we had opted because we we're, we're also trying to figure out if we could do some kind of hybrid. Right. Um, but yeah. Then, by July, we would be, you know, we're supposed to be fully open anyway. But but then the question comes: Are we just getting more participation, or you know? So 
we're trying to sort that technology stuff out. But it's your call. Okay. Well, um, is there any interest in revisiting when we start to get back in person? Okay, I'm seeing some shaking of the heads or not. Okay, okay, thumbs down. Okay, all right, that's that's clear. Thank you. Um, uh, second thing is that uh, so our our my ride program has been super successful as we heard earlier uh, today. And it's been so successful that uh, Capstone is interested in uh, replicating this program, um, but also including uh, servicing Barry. Um, and they were interested in a letter of support from us, and it would be going to um, one of the earmark um, pots of money through, I think it was Sanders's office. I'd have to go back and look, but. Um, any, any thoughts or objections to, um, supporting a letter of support for, for, uh, them, um, to, uh, tagging on to our My Ride program? Okay. Seeing a shaking of the heads. Um, any other, I just want to check any other thoughts. Is it fine? It's clear too, it wouldn't be just them doing it. It would be linking them so people could get rides back and forth. So. Right. Right. Okay. All right. Great. Seeing thumbs up. Great. Uh, so that I think is it for me also just, uh, well, actually I'll just say one more thing. Uh, again, just very grateful for all of you. So thankful for your brains and your patience. Um, okay. That's it. Uh, Donna, are you good to, to go next? Yes, really quickly. And I mentioned it because I may need, uh, a letter of support from the council or at least through the mayor. We're, CBPSA is working on a grant for the earmark that Leahy and Sanders are offering. And we wanted to include in that earmark money for the simulcast system that Capital West is proposing, the console that Montpelier and Barry are new consoles for the Barry and Montpelier, and a new built-in system of communication with Barry and Montpelier. And we're going to be putting that in for both Sanders and Leahy and probably a couple other items. And so it got up to like a couple million dollars, maybe more. And we've talked to, um, I talked to Bill. So far, the city has not put in an earmark for that. So we're hoping we can do a regional to make it more forceful. And I would hope that they wouldn't oppose, the council wouldn't oppose if Ann wrote a letter supporting us for that earmark the Public Safety Authority Board. It's all last minute. Sanders is due on the 15th and Alehis is due on the 21st. Short window. Sounds fine to me. Cool, great, okay. Seeing some thumbs up there, thank you. Uh, Righto, uh, Connor. All right, a couple of quick things. Um, just a heads up, I did get a request again um, for the uh, Black Lives Matter painting on State Street. Um, I spoke to, I mean, it was a really good idea, I think. Um, you know, no Noel was saying it would be nice if we could do it Juneteenth. Problem is, we're going to be ripping up like State Street over the summer, right? So it doesn't make much sense to paint it, rip it up and paint it again. So I, I, I'm trying to throw back some other options, maybe doing a banner that could be hung at the state house in the meantime. Uh, but just so you guys know, that might be, you know, it was nice and not controversial last time. So uh, <laughs> might be on the horizon again there uh, when we pick a date. Otherwise, um, homelessness task force today, again, uh, pretty staggering numbers. We have 238 adults in hotels in Washington County, 48 kids as of today. Um, and 112 of these are eligible for those uh, hotel rooms only because of COVID. So uh, again, when this goes away, we're in for a, a bit of a rude awakening as a state and county and city. Um, so just uh, had a good presentation um, by the director of facilities at Montpelier High School, uh, who's an adjunct professor at Norwich, had his class actually design some uh, day shelter designs uh, for Montpelier, which will incorporate showers, bathrooms, lockers, you know, it's really creative um, thinking and, you know, certainly no, no prices attached to this, but 
um, a, a lot of cool conceptual stuff um, that I think the committee is going to continue to look at, you know, um, as time goes on here. So I'll, I'll keep reporting on that, but that's it for me for now. Thank you. Um, Jay. Um, yeah, just a couple quick things. I wanted to uh, acknowledge Alec and, and the Parks Commission on um, the, the, the work that they're looking ahead towards, particularly um, some, uh, I think there's, there's a lot of energy and vision around improving Blanchard Park, which is, um, you know, tends to be, you know, it's so close to so many folks, but tends to be somewhat forgotten and, and I'm appreciative of um, some energy being put to that to that space to make it uh, more accessible um, and something that, that the city can better utilize. And then the other thing is, um, I just I, I've had occasion for whatever reason in this past like seven to ten days to um, to have interactions with with various city staff, um, and in each of those occasions they have without, without going into details have really gone above and beyond um what might be expected and were faced with challenges where they could have easily said you know i can't really we can't really deal with this now you know we're getting caught up we're short staffed all of that um but they did the opposite and they they you know took an approach to solving problems and helping the community um and i, I apologize for the vagueness but but Donna, DPW, and um, dealing with an ongoing uh, issue that's you know been been plaguing some homeowners for over for multiple years. Zach dealing with constant water issues, and Arnie um, being able to support a local youth soccer teams and club and helping with the equipment and gear, like all things that could have just been like you know we can't really deal with it, but they've all gone above and beyond. And so I just really wanted to um, acknowledge how, um, acknowledge them and, and, and Bill and, and know that, you know, we, we, hear, we hear a lot about, you know, the, you know, folks who have challenges with city staff, but, but so often I'm reminded that they are doing everything they can and going above and beyond. So I just um, wanted to acknowledge those folks um, for, for all they've done for, and all they do for the city. That's it. Thank you. We'll make sure they know. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Dan. Hey, three quick things. Um, first, picking up sort of maybe on Jay's last note, I, I had the opportunity to take a, finally take a tour of the fire station uh, and the chief, Bob Gowans, led it um, and had an opportunity to discuss some of the issues that the fire department is going through. And again, just amazing uh, work that our staff is doing and really uh, walking out of there proud of the department um, and, you know, the systems that they have put in place. Um, the second thing is response to one of the earlier public comments. Uh, I did actually follow up on the complaint that um, uh, Steve Whitaker had uh, made regarding a, a resident of Montpelier Housing, even though, you know, they have their own board and authority. Um, and it's a complicated situation like all of these. And, uh, you know, I think it's one of these things where um, this particular gentleman, you know, is, is in a difficult situation. And, ha and the housing authority, to my understanding, has given him lots of options. Um, or not lots, but options. Um, and so, you know, I think it's always careful. I, I was taught as a philosophy student to uh, not necessarily believe the worst in the philosopher you were reading, because that was always easy to do, um, but to try and hang with them a little bit to understand what they were saying. And I think in a lot of these situations, you know, we have city staff that are dealing with difficult situations that are far more complicated than we, we first hear. And it's always, um, I think we get, like Jay said, good responses if, you know, we have, um, we, we work with the people um, because we have a really good set of people that want to help. Uh, and are in public service for the right reasons. Um, the final thing I'll say is that, you know, we, the pool, I saw that the rec department is looking for volunteers to help with the pool, getting it back up in shape. And, uh, you know, I, I'll be looking to put my money where my mouth has been. Um, and so I hope others will as well and sign up for it because it's very exciting. And I actually had the privilege of uh, uh, an acquaintance revealed that his grandfather was the one who designed the pool. Um, 
He was uh, a federal engineer um, and highway engineer and designed it when it was the world's largest asphalt pool. I think it's now only the second largest, but uh, a really cool piece of history. Thanks. Okay, cool. All right, uh, Jack. I'll pass tonight. Okay, Lauren. I am also gonna pass. Okay. Um, all right, so I think that leads us to John. Oh, I don't have anything more to say than all my emails about Moldova. So I'll uh, have more news about that next week, end of next week, and I'll let y'all know. Okay, Bill. I do have a couple things before we go, um, and I'll try to keep these brief as well. Number one, I put in the weekly memo, um, if I mentioned uh, 1216 Main Street or the Mowat property, whatever. So the good news is you can see that work is getting done there, that road is being built, and it's finally cleaning up that mess. So that's great news. But also, um, we have received out of nowhere a couple of inquiries about potential, uh, you know, wanting to know if the city is going to sell that property or could it be developed, those types of things. And um, as you know, we had talked about that. Well, initially, it was going to be sold and redeveloped as part of the initial deal, and then it wasn't. We purchased the land. I think at one point, the council uh, indicated it preference for keeping it as green open space, uh, but also we were going to then do uh, a public master planning process. We went through that and that master plan indicated that they thought its best use was in commercial resale. Then, uh, you know, could, uh, excuse me, commercial use, construction developed. Then, of course, the pandemic hit. We all just, and, and I think the only focus we gave was, you know, paying, buying the property and we, we've agreed, we've come up with a plan to buy the property. And part of that thinking was it did have market value if we needed to sell it to get the money back. So you don't have to do anything tonight, but I think we will probably have this on an upcoming agenda because uh, I think we need to be thinking about what we wanna do with that. We Our first payment is due by the end of June. So, uh, and if we were to have, um, if we were to, you know, take proposals, what would those be? You know, we, I think we'd have to run a public process, but would we, you know, could we make, put conditions like there has to be a public bathroom attached to it or some, those kinds of things. So that, uh, you know, are there ways to think creatively about meeting some public needs as well as private needs? Um, so uh, again, just that's a heads up that's coming. Uh, we did have public records mentioned earlier in the meeting as well. Um, two things I, I want to say about that. One is uh, to not ignore the appeal, the documents were provided. So I felt there was no need to address the appeal because we gave him what he asked for. So that I thought that resolved the appeal. So if I didn't, I guess that's on me. Secondly, because of re confusion about requests um, from this one individual, but also from other people, we've actually created a new way to do it. And we have an email call, and it is public record request at montpelier-vt.org. And we're gonna, it'll be on our website. We're going to do some PR around it. And uh, what we're trying to do, so one of the things that happens, especially when we get uh, somewhat casual email public record requests, they go to a person. The person may or may not see the email or see it in a timely fashion. So what, what this does is actually sends it to multiple people. Um, so that we all get a chance to eyeball it and see, make sure that the right person's made aware. And also we're going to start keeping a public log of all the requests so the public can see which requests we're getting and who we're getting them from and how they've been responded to and so that we can all keep track of, of where we're spending our time on public record requests. So um, we have certainly taken this issue pretty seriously, talked about it at our team meetings about how to, how to improve on this and particularly um, in, as I said, some of them come in very formally and some of them come in quite casually uh, and they're not always as clear. So um, we're gonna try to deal with that. Uh, and then Dan mentioned the fire station tour, just uh, you should have gotten an email from Mary that we're setting up group tours as well for all the different facilities. So um, 
keep an, keep an eye on that. I don't know if it's gone out to you yet. It may have been out to our staff. I'm sorry. Okay. Now that I think about it, it was to schedule dates, but it's coming. So you'll be getting something with dates, tour dates. Great. That's Great. the end of my reports. Okay. Thank you. Uh, all right. So um, I'm going to be, I think, going into executive session to talk about collective bargaining. Uh, and I assume, Bill, this is something that we should do tonight and not put off. Is that accurate? Or it can be better. put off? It would be better to do at least quickly. Um, okay. Is that okay, team? We're, we're pushing, <laughs> pushing 11. Yes, Jack. Assuming we are going to do this, I, I move pursuant to 1 BSA section 313 1B that premature general public knowledge would clearly place the city at a substantial disadvantage regarding labor relations agreements with employees. And so it, well, there. there's a second. Okay, good. Second. Um, so I just would say that there, there's no expectation to be voting on anything. Now, what we've been doing is keeping this meeting open and then coming back in. To but adjourn. On the host, so when I close out of it, I'm going to close out of the meeting. I could go on another separate device. Um, or do we do it like we used to do the old way and just say, we'll take a note of when we adjourn? Uh, yeah. I, yeah, go ahead, Dan. I, I, I'd suggest we just simply a, a adjourn. Um, obviously, if we did have to take uh, any action, I think we're foreclosing that by doing it this way. But given yeah. what, yeah, the, the high, high unlikelihood, then I think what we're essentially saying is, is that we're closing out the public meeting um, and we'll just simply take a note when we come out of executive session. Um, and there's no need to further sort of keep people waiting, whoever they may be. Um, either here or out in TV land. <laughs> okay. Uh, so with that understanding, um, is there a motion? So we, we will not be coming back to this meeting if we go into executive session. Is there a motion? Well, we have a motion. Oh, I'm um, sorry. To make That's right. I'm, I forgot that we didn't vote on it. Okay. Um, there's a motion, a premature, pre, uh, premature knowledge, place city at a disadvantage. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, and opposed? All right, now is there a motion to go into executive session? Yes, Jack. And will we go into executive session? Second. And there's a second, and we have the understanding that we will be adjourning from there. We'll note the time, but we will not be taking any further action. Um, any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, and opposed? Aye. Okay. All right. I'll see you all.